Sun's gone bad. People and animals are melting everywhere. The world is coming to an end and there's nothing I can do about it. Will I be able to find food? Will I be able to defeat or avoid the horrific flesh monsters all around me? Or the desperate and hungry survivors left in this terrible new world? Keep watching and find out. Can I survive 100 days in SCP-001 when day breaks? Hey folks, it's your boy Kyle. You probably know me more for gaming videos than post-apocalyptic vlogs, but hey, I'm a versatile guy and I think I might go insane from the fear if I don't talk to somebody about all this craziness. If you're alive and seeing this right now, well, congratulations, you're probably doing a lot better than most people here, if you call them people now. But if you're seeing this a few years in the future, like, I don't know, you woke up from a 10 year coma, like Rick from The Walking Dead, and you're wondering what the hell happened to planet Earth, this video is probably gonna answer a lot of your questions. First things first, whatever you do, you've gotta stay away from the sun. It touches you. For even a second, you're dead. Or worse. Welcome to day one of the end of the world. For all of you who are still in a solid state of matter, you're probably wondering how I'm still alive too. Chances are it's for the exact same reason you are. Sheer dumb luck. I was down here in my gaming basement when day broke, just level grinding, when my TV got taken over by those SCP Foundation people, telling us that the sun's gone evil for whatever reason and now we've all gotta stay inside. Hell, if I was up there making myself a sandwich or grabbing another can of Mountain Dew, I'd be a freaking puddle right now. It's funny, my mom always told me spending all day indoors was bad for me. I'll have to mention that to her if she's alive. Point is, the world has gone to hell in a handbasket and now I've got only one objective, survive. I'm going to see if I can survive the horrifying post-apocalyptic world of when day breaks. For this first day, I'm just gonna hunker down. I kinda hope this is just a dream. Day two, all right, I'm up and at him, baby. Sadly, I can now report that this isn't a dream. This really is our horrible new reality. It's the sun's world, and we're just living in it. I've been spending the last several hours just waiting for nightfall outside. Against all odds, the internet and the power grid haven't gone down yet. Guess what's ever wrong with the sun only affects people and animals, not objects. Thank heaven for small mercies, right? People on Twitter have been live posting their situations out there, sharing advice on how we might all be able to stay out of the sun and survive this whole crazy thing. And hey, unless they're dead or full of hot air, maybe those SCP Foundation people know something about what's going on here. If we really can get to their buildings, maybe we can figure out how to reverse all this mess. Maybe. For now, I'm just gonna focus on staying alive. Hopefully, night hits soon. I really need to use the bathroom. Oh boy, it's day three and new issues are starting to pop up. I've been heading upstairs to go to the bathroom, but while I don't want to be crude, I'm running low on toilet paper and it's um starting to become a problem. I ran out of my last roll a few days ago and now I'm starting to go to my bookshelves. I have a few newspapers left that I tore up and used for toilet paper first. Um, they weren't exactly comfortable, but hey, you need to make do. But without toilet paper and without newspapers, I need to figure out what my favorite and least favorite books are. I'm starting with the prefaces of all the books, seeing as I don't generally need to reread them. You know, they're expendable, you know? A lot of these books I haven't read since I was like 15, so maybe those will be the ones. I can't make up my mind on whether I'm gonna use the Harry Potter books or the Percy Jackson and the Olympian books first. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments. I guess. I need to go to the bathroom. Day four, and now I'm trying to figure out how to pass the time. As you already know, I'm an avowed lifelong gamer. So while the electricity and the internet still work, I'm gonna keep gaming to pass the time and keep my all too precious sanity. I still have no intention of going out there even at night, but it's left me feeling kind of stir crazy. I wanna walk around the city again. I wanna go for a drive and feel the breeze in my hair. But seeing as I can't do that without experiencing a truly horrifying transformation, I've been spending a lot of time on GTA 5 online. Guess we'll never get GTA 6 now. What a bummer. Still, these last few days, it's felt more like Los Santos has been my home than where I actually live. There were even a few other people on the server. I don't know about you, but I take some comfort in that. Hey folks, I'm back, thankfully. Welcome to day five. 
We've still got electricity, thankfully, hence why you can still see this. I haven't heard anything from my family, and I don't want to assume the worst, but it's probably just best not to think about it. I've been heading up and downstairs to grab more food at night. You're probably wondering, but Kyle, why don't you bring it all downstairs to save going up altogether? Which I'd say, I don't have a fridge downstairs. <laughs> Smartass. But I'm starting to realize food is going to be a real issue here. It's kind of stupid now that I think about it. In all the zombie movies and TV shows I used to watch, it was all bullets and baseball bats killing your way through all those undead freaks and worrying about the rest later. Guess they don't want you to think about how you're only gonna ever be a couple weeks away from starvation. Kinda ruins the badass post-apocalyptic power fantasy. I only have a couple days worth of food left here, and after that, I'm gonna need to go out and search for more. Or I'm gonna need to relocate. I don't feel comfortable here anymore, you know? Early on, I thought when you got exposed to the sunlight, it just killed you. But no, it's worse. You keep living, you're just changed into one of those things. These last few days, I've looked out the windows when I've come up at night for food. I, I see them sometimes slithering in the yard or down the street. These things that used to be people. I wonder if they're people that I knew once before all this. And I tried to shove the thought out of my mind. Freaking myself out about all this doesn't help. I know that much. I just keep thinking about how they move. This like weird kind of purpose. Like they're searching for something, but what could they be searching for? I'm just gonna go and get more food. We'll speak again soon. Stay safe, whoever you are. <sighs> Welcome to day six. It's nighttime now and I'm heading out for the first time. I keep seeing these weird, slimy creatures everywhere, and they make me kind of sick to look at them, but I try my best to just keep moving. I'm on a mission tonight. I'm gonna go to the local supermarket and check to see if there's still food there, while also grabbing myself a quick snack. I'm gonna keep this one brief. I don't want to do a full shopping spree tonight. It's already too late. Just need to know the food is there. I decided earlier in the night if I survive this thing and the getting is good at the bargain mark, I'll make my way back tomorrow for something a little more, you know, substantial. After all the fewer trips I make out, the safer I'm likely to be. By the time I made it to the supermarket though, while I was practically a nervous wreck from the fear of turning into one of those things, I made an amazing discovery. While the windows were broken and the floor was a mess, most of the food was still there. Day seven, or should I say night seven. Galvanized by my success from the previous days, I decided to come back to the supermarket with a shopping cart. I wanted to get enough food for at least a week so I wouldn't need to come back out again. Hey, maybe I'm not so bad at this whole apocalypse thing after all. I grabbed plenty of canned food from the supermarket. Most of the perishables had already gone moldy by the time I showed up, so fresh fruit was out of the question. Suddenly I started getting scared about the thought of scurvy, but pushed it quickly from my mind. I'd cross that bridge when I got to it. Hey, hey, it's day eight and I'm still kicking. That's gotta count for something, right? I started taking more trips out at nighttime just to stretch my legs and keep the blood flowing. When the slithering things that were once people pass me, I just make myself scarce and hide in the shadows. You know, I, I hear them muttering sometimes in like this melted voice or voices. It's unsettling, but it's amazing what you'll get used to in just over a week. It's eerie to see all these streets without people in them. I know that I should probably just stay inside, but I, I really can't. I don't know if this will ever just stop, and if it doesn't, I, I don't want to spend my last days cooped up in my own basement. <sighs> Day 9. You know, there are some benefits to being in the post-apocalypse, to ever so slightly offset all the utterly crushing downsides. Well, during the day, we're all prisoners of the sun in our own homes. At night, we can do whatever the hell we want. I took a baseball bat that I keep in my closet and went to the local furniture store. I smashed up every single vase and all the windows like one of those rage rooms, because Nobody could stop me. Then afterwards, I went straight to the local computer and gaming store and took all the Alienware tech I could physically carry. You know, there's no value in money anymore. If you want something, you can just go and take it. Every cloud has a silver lining. Day 10. More GTA 5 today. I decided to get on my headset and speak to a few others who were still around and on the servers. You know, it was so nice to speak to other human beings for once. 
They came from all over the world and were dealing with the same evil sun and sanity as me. You have no idea how incredibly valuable it is to find people to talk to in a time like this. The other players had plenty of theories as to why all this had happened. Some thought it was some kind of mutant solar flare they'd remembered reading about on some conspiracy forum back in the day. Others speculated it was the result of some weapon created by the US or Russian or Chinese military that had gone wrong. One person said that maybe it was a punishment from God. Maybe on some level we all deserved it. You know, things got pretty quiet after that. Day 11. I've been having the most terrible nightmares lately. It's probably just a product of all the stress I've been under lately, but in the nightmares I'm running down a dark street being chased by those flesh creatures. I'm moving fast, but they're moving way faster. They're whispering to me, but I can't make out anything they're saying. This morning, which is to say evening, I woke up screaming and drenched in sweat. I can't really explain why, but I feel like something terrible is gonna happen soon. Okay, okay, I'm alive. That's enough, isn't it? And if you're watching this, I assume you're alive too. Congratulations, welcome to the nightmare space between day 11 and day 27. Sorry that I haven't been in contact for so long. As you can see, I'm not at home anymore. You couldn't pay me to go back there. <laughs> Not that money is worth anything anymore. A lot's happened since I last made one of these and I wish I could tell you any of it was good. Hell, I wish I could forget it all, but the things I've seen and heard, I don't think they're ever gonna leave my head no matter what I do. I thought about making another entry now and then, but I always found a reason to put it off. It's remarkable how your other priorities fall away when you're just thinking about where your next meal is coming from. It just kind of puts everything into perspective. Of course, during my travels, I saw more of those freaks slithering around. Sorry, sorry, I, I know I shouldn't call them that. It's kind of a coping mechanism, you know? It all gets a lot harder when you have to think of them as X people. That's another thing all these goofy zombie shows got wrong. It's a lot harder to separate what they were from what they are now. Especially when, you know, these were your friends, your neighbors, your... Well, I can't avoid talking about it forever, can I? I stuffed my backpack with whatever I could grab and left my home two nights ago. It wasn't just because I was going stir-crazy back there, though I admit that didn't exactly help. It was what happened there. I just came back from a food run, put most of it in the fridge, then retired back down into the basement to enjoy a late night snack and do a little gaming to keep myself sane. I'd been doing everything I could to reverse my circadian rhythms and sleep during the day just so I could be fully operational during the 12 hour period that going outside wouldn't melt me. But just like all those stories they told us when we were kids, there are monsters out there at night and they are looking for us. When I first heard the sound, I was, I wondered if it was something in game or maybe dripping from a leaky pipe no, it was too close to be fake and too viscous to be water. That's when I looked at the door and saw this awful pink slime slithering its way underneath my door. It was one of those things, those ex-people trying to get in. That'd be bad enough, but then it started talking to me. Kyle, my darling, why are you all cooped up down here? It isn't healthy. You ought to come outside, sweetie. Get some sun, my darling. It was my mom. Well, it used to be. I guess she wanted to come over and visit me. Needless to say, I got out of there and I've got no intention of going back. That place is dead to me now. I don't even want to think about that voice ever again. Both her and so not her. So now I'm on the move. Guess I'll speak to you again when I stop. Stay safe out there. Day 28. I decided it was best to make my way out of town towards the fringes. The day first broke, the people who were in the most densely populated areas were the first to go. That's why I decided to hole up in a gas station last night just to avoid the sun. But during the night, people came. Not ex-people, actual people. They showed up in a jeep outside the building, refueled and then came in. They were wearing black, cobbled together outfits and hockey masks. They were all either carrying bats or axes too. You can probably understand why I didn't decide to introduce myself when they busted their way in. I concealed myself in a broom closet while they searched around. It was nerve shredding. I'd never been more thankful in my life when they left. Day 29, coming up on a month of this madness. After the incident at the gas station, I realized I needed some kind of defense. It's not just the sun and those creatures I need to worry about. Just like the old world, people could be dangerous here too. That's why I snuck into a gun store in the dead of night. Some of it had been looted, but much like the supermarket near my house, there was plenty still here. 
The walls were covered in all manner of rifles, shotguns, and even submachine guns. I heard somewhere that revolvers are more reliable and easy to maintain than other types, so since I'm a gun novice, I grabbed a revolver and stuffed my pockets with as many bullets as I could carry. Let's hope I never have to use any of them. Day 30. Do I get to call this a month of survival? I mean, if we're talking February, I'd be a month in already. What a horribly dubious honor that is. I saw something disgusting last night, and I thought I'd share it just to get it off my mind. Last night, as I was moving through the wilderness, I saw a group of other survivors gathered around a campfire. I remained scarce, but approached just to see what was going on, still carrying my revolver just to be safe. But the people around the campfire were eating something, and when I saw what they were eating, I swear to God, I almost threw up. They were chopping up one of the ex-people, hooking the parts over the fire, and eating it. Day 31, a month by anyone's definition. Ever since seeing those others eating one of the ex-people, I've had trouble eating even normal food myself. My stomach aches and my throat burns. God, I feel so weak. I keep laying down and resting. I know I need to eat soon if I want to survive to day 32, but every time I think about eating, I think about the gooey flesh of the ex-people. Sometimes I wish I hadn't survived this long. I'll eat soon. I just need to sleep first. Day 32 to 43. If you live this long, you really ought to be proud of yourself. I've seen thousands of those slimy ex-people, and there's probably millions more out there. Hell, maybe even billions if we're being honest with ourselves here. Am I just talking into the void here? Is there even anyone else out there who's human enough to watch this stuff? <sighs> maybe I just need to keep thinking about posterity. On the off chance that the world ever gets better and we reach some time where children are born again and all this fades from human memory, you'll still have these stupid pointless little videos to remember how awful all this was. That way, at least I can make myself believe this all had some kind of, I don't know, Point. So, what's happened? With me, not much. Still moving at night, surviving, hiding in closets and underground parking complexes during daylight, I'm down to uh, my last few cans, so I'm hoping to hit a supermarket soon. God, what a ridiculous way to go. Starving in this new world with so many new, interesting ways to die. With the ex-people, things have been a little more eventful. There used to be one blob to a person, but they've started joining up? That's the best way I can put it. Things that used to be people and animals are starting to melt together, getting bigger and bigger. They've never been aggressive, but I think it's best to stay out of their way. Whatever all this is about, I am streetwise enough to know that it can't be anything good. I'll just keep moving and I hope you can do the same, whoever the hell you are. Hopefully the next time I check in with you, it's with better news than this. Day 44. I saw a shootout on the road last night. The people who are left, the ones who are still indeed people, are becoming less human. Something about situations like this, this sustained stress and pain and hopelessness, it weighs on you. There are no rules in the post-apocalypse. The only thing that can stop you from doing anything is a bullet to the head. Five or six people last night, as afraid and desperate and hungry as me, gunned each other down. They did this for reasons I will never understand, even if I wanted to, because there are no survivors left to tell the tale. What a funny world we live in. Day 45. I sleep when I can. It's surreal. I remember when I feared the dark and loved bright sunny days. Even all this time in, I still don't think I'm used to the switch being flipped. I've been having awful dreams again. I'm still running in them with a deep red sun shining up in the sky. I'm being chased by a mountain of flesh the size of Mount Everest. It's swallowing up the city behind me and it keeps getting closer. No matter how fast I go, I just, I, I can't escape. They'll get me eventually. Something terrible is going to happen soon. I just know it. Day 46. I shot a man today. I don't know if he survived. I hope he lived. We encountered each other inside an abandoned building. I think we spooked each other and didn't have any time to ask if we were friends or foes. We were too afraid either way. We both drew our weapons and I was faster than he was. When my revolver discharged and he collapsed, I ran off. Sun would come up in a few hours and I just needed to find another place to hide. What the hell have I become? I don't know how things could get any worse than this. Not to self. In the future, don't even dare to think, how could things get any worse? Because if I've learned anything since this whole nightmare started, 
That is never a rhetorical question. Welcome to the space between day 47 and day 64. If you're still alive and watching this, I am so sorry. So I've got good news and I've got bad news. I'll give you the good news first. I've seen more people who haven't been changed yet. And the bad news? Last time I saw them, they were being dragged out into the light, kicking and screaming in the tendrils of one of those horrible flesh monsters I was telling you about last time. They've gotten a lot bigger now. And when I told you they weren't aggressive, well, um, yeah, I, I spoke a little too soon. I can't just sleep during the day like I used to. These monsters, and that's what they are now. They're monsters, not people anymore. They patrol, they hunt, they actively enter buildings searching for hiding places, searching for people they can drag out into the light. I've seen it with my own two eyes. The second they're out, they'll just start melting and fusing with the mass, making it even bigger, adding another voice to the chorus. And I hate myself, because every time I've seen it happen, all I can think is, thank God that's not me. God, I wish I could do something to help, to save them. That's not the world we live in. The second they touch the light, it is already over. I wouldn't be helping anyone by adding my flesh to one of those things. I don't want them using my body to get to other people. There's only one thing I can do now. Keep moving at night, stay hidden, get away from population centers. Mm. I've realized where I need to go now. I've still got a distant memory of those broadcasts in the earlier days of the event. The SCP Foundation. I noted down coordinates to the nearest facility they had on the books. And if I'm honest, Nearest is only a relative term, because at this rate, it's gonna take me an eternity to get there. But it'll be worth it in the end when I get there. It'll all be worth it if I can at least get some answers, at least know why the world turned into this hell. Those SCP folks seem better prepared for this than anyone, so even if they can't fix this, they've at least got to have answers, right? Somebody needs to have answers. I really want to believe that. When the sun goes down, I'll start moving again. If you're watching this, wish me luck. I don't have much food left. I'll do what I can. Yeah, hey, I realize I'm not looking great right now, but trust me, you should see the other guy. Day 65 to day 86. Never thought I would make it this far, but hey, life's just full of surprises. Before you ask, and I mean, why would you ask? It's not like I can hear you. It wasn't one of the monsters that did this to me. It was another person just like me. Desperate, hungry, afraid. The one difference between me and them was the fact that they had a handgun and I didn't. They asked for all the food I had and when I wasn't exactly forthcoming, they decided to shoot me and steal the last of my food while I lay bleeding on the ground. Oh, well, okay, that's not entirely fair. They did leave me with one protein bar, which I had to cave and eat a couple days ago. Since then, I've just been foraging what little food I can from plants along the way during my nighttime walks. But it isn't much, and my wound is giving me grief. I sure hope they've got doctors at this SCP Foundation, or otherwise... Ow. I may be even more out of luck than I thought. Here's the good news for you, since I know how much you love that. I'm not far off of the Foundation site now. Even in this state, I'm probably only a couple weeks away. I think maybe I can will myself to live that long, at least. If I can get some answers just before I die, then I can be happy. And sometimes, folks, that's all you can ask for. <sighs> Final stretch. Let's hope I see you again on the other end. Stay safe. I'm here. I'm here. The SCP Foundation on day 100. But I don't understand. Where is everybody? Hello? Is anybody there? God damn it. Why is nobody here? I, I don't understand. They were meant to have the answers. They were meant to know what was going on here, but they're all gone too. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Is this it? Is it all just over? The end of the freaking world as we know it? It isn't fair. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. Wait, are those footsteps? Hello? Yes! Hello! I'm over here! Who's there? Oh my god, what the hell is that thing? No! No, get away from me! Oh god! Disgusting. Oh god, oh god, I'm trapped in the infinite Ikea. How long have I been in here? Can I get out? How can I get out? How can I survive the vicious staff of the infinite Ikea and work with the other survivors in this terrifying endless building? Okay, let's start from the beginning. Day one. 
I'd come to this flat pack nightmare with my lovely wife, Brenda, to pick up some stupid sofa she saw online. We could have ordered it in, but me being a cheapskate and a fool, instead decided it'd be a dandy idea to head in and pick it up ourselves, even though I can't stand shopping in these giant stores. Of course, it didn't take long for us to get separated. I was wandering around, just pretending I knew what I was doing, surrounded by unfamiliar people. Then, not surrounded by any people at all. Like the complete doofus I was, I'd somehow gotten lost. Just needed to find my bearings again, and then I could call Brenda to come save me. But I never did find my bearings. The hours went on, and I was still lost. Day two. My dominant emotion on this day was nothing more than sheer humiliation. Knowing I had been bested by a damn Swedish furniture store. I spent the night before sleeping on a futon, wondering how I'd gotten myself into this flat pack calamity. I spent the day searching for food, my confusion and exhaustion increasing by the moment. For a while, I even entertained the idea that I might have died and gone to some Nordic hell. That night, I went to bed hungry, knowing if I didn't eat soon, I might be found as a skeleton on a dusty old futon. Oh, God, I can't end like this. I can't die on day two. Day three. I continued my journey through the labyrinthian bowels of the Ikea, disoriented by the endlessly iterating collections of cheap furniture. You know, there was something terrifying about the emptiness of it all. This affordable but impossible to assemble void. Starvation has always been one of the most horrific deaths, hasn't it? You could only imagine my relief when I saw the figure standing a few feet in front of me, dressed like a member of IKEA staff. I'd found salvation! I'd found someone who could help me out of here! But when I approached, I realized something was horribly wrong. This wasn't a human being standing before me. It was a monster. The being I'd later come to know is called the Staff by the many people who fear them. It chased me, repeating, The store is closed, you need to vacate the premises, flailing for me with its long, frightening limbs. I only survived day three because I locked myself in a closet and just waited while it hammered against the wood with its fists. Once the night was over, it left and I was able to escape. Day four. I was feeling some intense hunger pangs on this day. Not to mention the fact that I now knew there were monsters out there just waiting to beat me to death if they caught me when the lights turned down. Needless to say, I wasn't in the best headspace, and I didn't have enough charge on my phone to justify opening up my meditation app. Then, I found Nirvana. I found the cafeteria, stocked full of delicious, warm Swedish meatballs. You know, no food has ever tasted so sweet to me. And this delicious meal also gave way to one of the most exciting new developments, Gloria. Gloria was a veteran. She taught me everything I needed to know about this place. Even on the first day I met her, she felt like someone I'd known for years. It was her that took me back to her home in this place. A little fortress made of Ikea furniture filled with a whole community of other people trapped in there. It was like being allowed into the Garden of Eden. Day five, and it feels good to be alive. I met up with all the different people around the camp. They tell me the most bizarre and fascinating stories. Uh, this sounds crazy, I know, but I get the sense not all of them came from the same place as me. Different Ikeas in different countries, or maybe even as nutty as it sounds, from different worlds. One guy, Tony, who's been trapped in here for a year and some change, we got to talking about different vacations we'd taken on the outside. He told me he was from New York, and I told him I visited there once and I'd love going to see the Statue of Liberty up close. That's when he told me that he'd never heard of the Statue of Liberty. You know, I didn't know what to make of that. Strange little details aside, I couldn't be happier to be there with other people. The next step would be finding a way out of here, and back to Brenda. Day six. Gloria and several others led me out on our first excursion. Missions where the goal was to collect more food and supplies and map out the surrounding area. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I saw a staff member standing in our path at one point and the others all just laughed at me. The staff member just stood there, placid and still. Gloria told me that it's okay. The staff are harmless during the day. It's only nighttime when they enter their pattern of aggression. So long as you don't get lost during the daytime, you're generally fine. The team often use strength, like thesis, to trail behind them and ensure they don't get lost. It was clear they'd been here long enough to work out systems for every possibility. Felt like I was in good hands with them. We collected meatballs and some rugs to fortify the walls and headed back. Day 7. This was the first night that we had to fend off a full-on attack. Those monsters. The staff came at us in huge groups, pounding at the outside of our perimeter with their bald fists. It was terrifying. 
As we were fighting them off, we tied IKEA kitchen knives to the end of curtain rails and speared them, one by one, until all of them were dead. <sighs> they just kept coming. More and more and more of them. When it looked like one of the walls to the north of the community was going to fall, everyone around me started to panic. That's when Barry, one of the biggest men in the camp, grabbed a hammer in each hand and went outside. He fought like a beast, taking on staff member after staff member, tanking hit after hit. It was something to see. That's when he took off into the depths of the store, drawing the staff away behind him and saving us all. We never saw Barry again after that, but he's the reason all of us made it past day seven. Thank you, Barry, wherever you are. Day eight. Gloria took me out alone today, on another search for the escape. That's when she told me about her sister. She'd gone shopping in Ikea with her well over a year ago now, when she was separated and got lost in here, just like me. I had a lot in common with her, including my feelings of guilt for abandoning my loved ones and my drive to escape and be united with them. While we were out that day, we didn't find anything useful. Gloria seemed sad, but unsurprised. The infinite Ikea had its way of slowly grinding you down. Days 9 to day 17. Despite a rocky start, I was finding my legs in the infinite Ikea. I started to get to know my fellow Ikea prisoners. I started to understand and truly befriend them. We went on expeditions pretty much daily, either to collect new food, more supplies to help build up our community, or to keep searching for an exit. To me, it started to feel like we were making progress, and that helped a great deal to keep my emotions semi-stable. But it wasn't the same for Gloria. After all, she'd been here for so much longer than me, and she had her sister to consider on the outside. To her, these routines I was becoming part of now felt like a prison within a prison. She was trapped. Had her sister forgotten her out there? Had she been declared dead? Were people even still looking for her? And it was on day 18 that it all got a little too much for poor Gloria. She snuck out of the camp at night, when the staff were most active trying to find the exit. Sadly, that had cost Gloria her life. There's no way of knowing what happened to her exactly, but considering how bruised up her body was when we found her, it was easy to make an educated guess. She'd gotten bum-rushed by the staff and beaten to death before she could have even mustered up a defense. It was a horrible way to go. We tried giving her a dignified funeral as we could, given the circumstances, closing her up in a body-sized box. That was the day I decided to stop just trying to survive and start trying to escape. I owe that to Brenda. If she really had gotten out, I couldn't keep her waiting. But I wouldn't be alone. As it turns out, another two members of the little Ikea community I'd come to know were willing to risk it all with me. A man named Kelvin and a young woman named Vicky. They were sick of just waiting around and fending off attacks from the staff night after night. They both told me they'd rather die during an escape attempt than while cowering under a pile of cheap rugs. And so, each armed with claw hammers from the six-piece Ikea Fix-A toolkit and as many Prutha Tupperware containers full of meatballs that we could carry, we set off into the great unknown of Ikea. We traveled for weeks, marking our tracks on the ground with the Mala Mixed Colors chalk selection so we never got caught going in circles. One day bled into the next. Nights were spent trying to hide in closets and bathtubs while the staff hunted relentlessly for people just like us. Every single time, we got lucky. That is, until day 41. Here's something you need to know about the infinite Ikea. You're probably already aware, if you're watching this, that the 24-hour cycle of night and day is dictated by the store lights up above. But the space between day and night isn't a gradient here. It's a cliff. You can be minding your own business when suddenly, hitch darkness, and now the staff are on your ass. That's exactly what happened on day 41. We're in the middle of a kitchenware selection, surrounded by a few docile members of staff, when suddenly, the lights switched off, and they went hostile on us. They look pretty goofy after the initial shock has worn off, but believe me when I say that these monsters can really pack a mean wallop when they want to. And we received a reminder of this unfortunate fact that night. The staff swarmed us, repeating that awful phrase, the store is closed, you need to vacate the premises, while they struck and flailed at us. If it wasn't for our trusty claw hammers, we would have been dead that night. Thankfully, we were able to give better than we were getting. We managed to kill a decent number of staff members, and then make a run for a section with better hiding places. Myself, Vicky, and Kelvin all stowed away in a large wardrobe, until we saw light flickering through the crack in the door, like we were rejected extras for some painful community theater take on the Chronicles of Narnia. But while we survived that night, we didn't survive unscathed. 
My face was swollen from a nasty punch one of the staff members dealt me, and from the pain in my chest, I might have been dealing with a few broken ribs. Kelvin sprained his ankle during the escape, and Vicky had a cut on her forehead from when one of the staff members kneed her in the face during the fray. You never win these fights, you just survive them. We made a temporary camp in the area where we could rest and recover, as well as shaking off the justifiable fear of death or grievous harm that dampened our resolve to get out of this place. That took us to day 53. Of course, food was always a concern. I don't want to romanticize what happened in there, as much as I'm sure someone on the outside might want to imagine this whole experience as some kind of exciting survival horror game, but I assure you, it was less survival horror and more survival and horror. Meaning not only are we suffering from constant fear, stress, and paranoia for our safety in here, but we also need to keep ourselves fed and watered. You're just as likely to die from starvation in here as you are to be beaten to death. We went in search of another IKEA kitchen where we could fill up on more water and meatballs, your lifeblood in a place like this. It took us several more days of searching and hiding, searching and hiding, before we hit pay dirt. By the time we actually got our hands on the food and water, we were starving and practically coughing up dust. Those meatballs were the most delicious food I've ever tasted, and I could tell from their faces that Kelvin and Vicky felt exactly the same way. Though, at the moment, I told myself if, no, when I get out of here, I'd never eat another meatball. It'd probably give me war flashbacks, or I guess, store flashbacks? We filled up our Tupperware and shoved them back into our Kia proving backpacks. Then we needed to keep moving, keep searching, and keep marking the ground behind us as we fanned out into the great flat pack yonder, avoiding confrontations wherever we could. But the three of us still had no idea what insanity was waiting for us out there. We had no idea that there were even more dangerous things than the staff lurking in the shadows. Day 68. Of course I kept count, writing it down on the back of my Jatlik coloring book. Trust me, when every night could mean a horrible death, you keep track of the nights. Not a single one of them escapes you. At a certain point, I think we all adapted in our own way. It was back to caveman times again, learning to be like our primal ancestors, hiding away from the dark and the monsters that hid there. So it was extremely surprising for us to get the most brutal attack during the day. At first, I thought we were being attacked by the staff during daylight hours, like a bolt from the blue. That's when we noticed they weren't attacking with their hands. They were all holding kitchen knives, holding us up like bandits. That's when we realized what had actually happened here. We weren't being attacked by the staff. We were being attacked by other humans dressed like the staff, wearing their hollowed out heads like grisly masks. They told us that we were coming with them, and if we resisted, they'd cut us to ribbons. And seeing as none of us were movie action heroes, we thought it'd be best to do exactly what they said. This is how we fell into the clutches of Generalissimo Vardagen. Day 69. But things were not nice. I mean, I get it. Yeah, ha, ha, funny, nice. I don't know if I'd mentioned this before, but the community I became part of in the Infinite Ikea after meeting Gloria was just one of many. Nobody knows exactly how many people are trapped in here. I'm hardly a martyr for spending 68 days in there. I know people who've been trapped in there for years, who've given all hope of escape and accepted their lot in life. They became the elders of a lot of these communities, helping others adjust. Though, of course, Generalissimo Vartagen was not one of these people. Myself, Vicky, and Kelvin were dragged by the strangers dressed as staff members into a fort made of smashed up wood nailed together into a huge, ominous structure. It was a far more extensive structure than any of the communities I'd visited or even heard about before in the infinite Ikea. It was a true fortress, guarded by many more of those knife-wielding people dressed in the clothes and in the flesh of the staff. It looked like some evil cult straight out of a damn horror movie. I had never seen anything like it. We were dragged into a kind of tent in the middle of the camp, made out of stitched together rugs. That's where we met Generalissimo Vardagen, surrounded by his guards. I'd later learn his namesake was a set of steak knives stocked in the IKEA kitchenware sections, similar to the knives being wielded by his gallery of goons. The Generalissimo himself was dressed like some absurd tin pot dictator, wearing a silly hat and a jacket covered in fake metals. His whole presence felt like a cosmic punishment for daring to believe things couldn't get any more absurd than they already were. His men forced us down onto our knees, and Vardagen cleared his throat to speak. Quake interferes the sight of this Ikea's ruler. 
the great and powerful Generalissimo Vardagen. I have united kingdoms from the gardening and bathroom supplies departments and crushed dissenting tribes in the office furniture sections to the west. If you wish to live, you will swear fealty to me and join my legion of servants. If you do as I say, you will be given safety and security from the staff come nightfall. If you do not bend the knee, I will have you destroyed! By the time his little spiel was done, the man was red in the face and sweating profusely. It was clear that, much like your average IKEA shelving unit after a couple weeks of use, the great Generalissimo Vardagen had a few screws loose. None of us liked the idea of becoming slaves to some flat-packed Genghis Khan, so we tried to persuade him to just let us go, telling him that we hoped to escape the store, and with our help, he could escape too. That's when we learned a sobering lesson. For some people, life inside the infinite Ikea was better than life outside. In the real world, the Generalissimo had been a twice-divorced ex-salary man with nothing to his name but debts and regrets. But here, he was a demigod, a leader among the rest of us mere mortals. Why would he ever want to go back to the world that had given him nothing and taken everything? Day 70 to Day 84. We were forced into weeks of hard labor after that toiling under the Generalissimo and his gang of brigands. The soldiers worked us like dogs, making us carry food and furniture back to the Generalissimo's Scandinavian furniture fortress. One day bled into the next. The best I could say about any of this was at least we were safe behind the walls of the fortress at night, so we didn't need to worry about getting murdered by the staff in our sleep. However, tragedy struck again on day 85. Kelvin couldn't take the work anymore. One day, I think his mind just snapped. He refused to follow orders from the Generalissimo and his lieutenants, even when they threatened him with death. Sadly, that night they would prove that this wasn't just some empty threat. When night fell, they tied up Kelvin's arms and legs and left him outside the fortress. We were just forced to watch as the staff assembled and beat our friend to death while he lay there, unable to defend himself. Even in all the time I'd spent in the infinite Ikea, that was the most harrowing thing I'd ever seen. But in one of the few acts of righteous cosmic justice that we'd seen since being trapped in here all those months ago, just a few days after Kelvin's brutal execution, Day 90, the day of the revolution. While I'd love to tell you that I started this, there are no heroes in this story. I just happened to be the one telling you about it. Some internal conflict between the Generalissimo and his men boiled over into a kind of civil war that tore the fortress apart from within. Vicky and I escaped, but in different directions. I'd like to imagine she got out in the end. It helps me sleep at night. But one thing I will tell you, Generalissimo Vardagen found out what happened to tyrants, big and small, when his closest confidants give him the Julius Caesar treatment with the knives from which he took his name. I don't think there's anything wrong in taking a little joy in that. For days afterwards, I just walked. I felt so empty, but I refused to just lay down and let myself die. Even though so much of the hope had been beaten out of me, I couldn't betray Brenda by just giving up in here. It wouldn't be right. It just wouldn't be right. The days ticked on and nothing changed. I had no food, no weapons, and I was getting so tired. Then night fell, and the staff started chasing me. They seemed even more aggressive than before. I couldn't fight. All I could do was run. I ran, and I ran, and I ran, not even looking where I was going as the crowd of staff started catching up with me. Getting closer and closer, I ran until there was a doorway before me. I didn't even think. I just was trying to get away. That's when I noticed that the store's roof was no longer above me. For the first time in 100 days, I was once again tasting fresh air. That's right, folks. On day 100, I was out. I truly made it out. This victory, however, was short-lived. A group of about six staff members burst out of the front door behind me, charging towards me with ferocious speed. I couldn't move, all I could do was grit my teeth and wince, ready to accept my death at what had otherwise been the high point of my recent life. What a depressing irony that would be. But instead, gunshots rang out through the air. A hail of bullets cleaved through the staff members, dropping them to the ground mere feet away from me, stone dead. That's when I turned to see a group of men with assault rifles and tactical gear walking towards me. In any other situation, this might have been terrifying, but right then, it was the happiest moment of my life. These men took me away from the parking lot of what is now an abandoned Ikea. They told me they were from a group called the SCP Foundation, and that I'd been declared missing for some time now. I didn't care about any of that. I just asked them if Brenda had gotten out. 
If she hadn't escaped too, then this was all for nothing. You can't even imagine my relief when they told me that Brenda was never even trapped. She was the one who reported my disappearance after I dropped off the face of the earth in what she thought was a perfectly normal IKEA shopping session, before that building was shut down and cordoned off under some less insane pretense. But Brenda was alive and safe, and I'd get to be with her again. I have no shame in telling you I cried, but I'd like to specify that they were absolutely tears of joy. The men from the SCP Foundation told me that they'd give me a medicine that had helped me forget all this after I told them my story, and there's no part of me that has a problem with that. Some things are better left forgotten. But before the SCP Foundation wipes it all away from my mind and I get to go live with my beloved wife once more, this was how I survived 100 <laughs> dreadful days in the infinite Ikea. Glass shatters, a D-Class screams, the shill cry of an alarm sounds. There's been a containment breach at the SCP Foundation. Somehow the Plague Doctor has escaped his cell and is making a break for it. Against all odds, he finds the exit and he's out. He's free. He's on the lamb. But how long can he elude the Foundation's attempts to track him down and recontain him at any cost? It will take all of his cunning, his intellect, and his strange anomalous abilities, but he's going to try and hold on to his newfound freedom as tightly as he can. I'm getting ahead of myself here though. Let's start at the beginning. Day 1 SCP-049, or the Plague Doctor, may be an esoteric anomaly whose grasp of medicine is practically medieval, but he's still a doctor. He didn't get this far by not paying attention to his surroundings. So when an unexpected power outage triggered by an experiment gone wrong somewhere in the bowels of Site-19 gave him the chance to escape captivity, well, he took it. The Foundation had recently revoked his access to live experimental subjects again, and he had had enough. It was time to seize the moment and make a mad dash for freedom. With the security system down, the doctor broke open the door to his cell, grabbed his trusty apothecary bag, and ran into the hall. Guards were already swarming, ready to drag him back into captivity, but he had planned ahead. Swiftly, he uncorked a glass bottle of silvery liquid, spilling it onto the floor, where it began to eat away at the tile, the shoes of the guards, and if they maintained contact for too long, the soles of their feet. This bought him just enough time to keep running. The sounds of screaming down another hall and the raucous laughter of one Dr. Jack Bright signaled to the doctor that most of the Foundation staff were otherwise occupied. With this in mind, he sprinted on, letting his chitinous body carry him to the exit. Then for the first time in far too long, fresh air on his beak, the sun in his eyes, the scent of cut grass and damp leaves from the last night's rain, the world was here, waiting for him just as he had left it. Of course, the world was still very much in danger. He hadn't just broken free for himself, but to address the pestilence head on as best as he could. But for now, as he heard the sound of the alarm, the guards gaining on him, he had to prioritize his own safety first. He had to hide. Day 2 he ran for ages. He couldn't be quite sure how long as he had no way to measure the passage of time except the position of the sun in the sky. It set, it rose, bathing the countryside in soft yellow light, and set again, plunging the land into darkness, all while he continued to run. Then finally, the plague doctor stopped. He had found a farm. There was a little farmhouse, but he did not dare disturb the sleeping family and alarm them. Instead, he turned to the barn for shelter. He let himself in, tiptoed past the horses as they slept there, and made himself a bed from straw and a burlap sack. From his bag, he pulled a pillow and a little spray bottle. He misted the pillow with a lavender-scented oil, and finally allowed himself a moment to rest. He did not need to sleep like ordinary men, but after such a long journey, he could get pretty close. Day 3 the morning of the Plague Doctor's third day of freedom began with the high-pitched whinny of a terrified horse and the frantic stamping of hooves. The doctor opened his eyes to the sight of one of the horses, now awake and not at all happy to see a stranger in its barn, making its fear and displeasure known. Buttercup? A man called from outside the barn. That you, girl? What's got you spooked? The door to the barn creaked open, and before the doctor could do anything, he was face to face with the farmer who owned the land. Who are you? What are you doing in my barn? The man demanded. Good sir, 
I apologize for the intrusion. I am but a humble traveler seeking shelter. You need to get out of here and stop scaring my horses now. Don't make me come back with my shotgun. No need for that sort of thing. I, I, I will be on my way. The doctor collected his things and decided to spare the old farmer rather than use more extreme methods to change his mind. He left the barn in a hurry. Day four. Day four. With the farm far behind him, the plague doctor trudged along on his journey, always keeping an eye out for unmarked vans and armed guards. So far though, he was safe. He hadn't had a spare moment to return to his experiments though, which was beginning to wear on him. The work was what had motivated him to break out in the first place, and now he wasn't sure when he would be able to make time for it. Cruel irony, indeed. But then, as if his silent prayer had been answered, he heard a peculiar sound coming from the woods, just off the dirt road he was walking down. A sickly bray from an injured animal, a poor soul in need, a patient. He followed the sound to its source. A deer lay on its side, clearly sick or injured somehow. Do not be afraid, my friend, the doctor said softly. You are sick, but I can make you well. He sat his bag down on the grass and got to work. First, he touched the deer with a gloved hand, stopping its heart and putting it out of its misery. Then he reached into his bag for his trusty tools and some of his best medicines. In no time at all, the deer was reanimated, cured, walking around again like new. Sure, it was a little bit different, stumbling a bit, and each eye looking in a different direction, but the doctor considered the treatment a success. A day well spent. Day 5 the next day, feeling reinvigorated after his successful encounter with the deer, the plague doctor began his quest for shelter anew. He walked for most of the day until, as the sun was setting, he came upon something curious. A house, dilapidated looking, with a large sign out front reading, House of Horrors, Enter If You Dare. Though he didn't know it, the doctor had stumbled upon the local town's premier seasonal haunted house attraction. To him, it was simply an empty house he could take up residence inside. He was curious and a bit perplexed as he walked past plastic skeletons, animatronic werewolves that popped out from behind styrofoam tombstones, and giant fake spiders and cotton cobwebs. None of the fake monsters gave him trouble, so though he was confused by what he saw, he continued to explore the house. Then, he found something incredible. A laboratory. There was a long stainless steel table with a mannequin strapped to it. A row of prop surgical tools sat on a train next to the mannequin, and along the back shelf were rows and rows of jars filled with liquids that looked like something the plague doctor himself would pull out of his bag. He couldn't believe his eyes. After wandering aimlessly for days, he found the perfect place, almost as if it had been made just for him. Of course, it wasn't. It was for the paying customers who would be coming to the haunted house the next day, along with the actors hired to perform inside, but he didn't need to know any of that yet. He replaced the jars with his own and the tools with functioning ones. With the exception of the plastic body on the table, which he privately wished was a real human subject, this was absolutely perfect. Day 6 the haunt actors showed up for work and were surprised to find a new guy had beat them there, and he was already in costume. They shrugged it off. They were making minimum wage, and that wasn't enough to ask any questions. They were there to suit up and get spooky, and that was it. They did appreciate his Plague Doctor costume, though. It was much higher budget than anything they had. Did you make that get up yourself? Asked a friendly zombie. Indeed I did. The doctor replied cheerfully, happy to finally encounter a group of individuals who were unafraid of him. Nice, bro! The zombie gave him a thumbs up, and if the plague doctor could with his rigid beaked face, he would have smiled. These new colleagues were a bit unusual looking, with their ghostly white faces, vampire fangs, green tinged makeup, and excess fur, but their kindness was encouraging. Meanwhile, the haunt actors were gossiping amongst themselves, wondering where the new plague doctor character came from. Who approved it? Who hired this guy? Why was he doing that accent? Whatever he was, whatever. He was plenty scary and nice enough guy to get to work with. So Frankenstein's monster let the plague doctor have the laboratory set and moved himself into the graveyard. The customers loved him too, shrieking with delight as he welcomed them into his laboratory. 
asking if any of them would like to volunteer to be a test subject. Lucky for them, they had already been warned not to touch any of the actors while walking through the attraction. As his first night at his unintentional job came to a close, the Plague Doctor's new friends bid him farewell. We're gonna go to a bar up the road for a couple drinks, the ghostly bride said. Wanna come? Ah, no time for revelry, the Plague Doctor replied. I must attend to my work. Take care, the woman just laughed. Okay, see you later. And so the Plague Doctor spent his night in the haunted house again, tinkering with his tools and his tissue samples, listening to the royalty-free scary music tape play again and again on repeat into the night. Day 7 The next day, attendance at the haunted house was slow. The actors with little to do spent their time scrolling aimlessly on their phones, filming joke videos for social media, and pranking each other. One of them got the bright idea to pull a prank on the new hire, the stranger that none of them knew much about. He would have a friend turn out the lights in the laboratory, and when the lights were turned back on, he would have replaced the mannequin on the table. He couldn't have known what would happen. All he wanted to do was startle the new guy, freak him out with the sight of an unexpected werewolf on his operating table. And it was effective. Sort of. The plague doctor froze in place when the lights went out calling, Hello? What is happening? And when the room was illuminated once more, he took in the sight of the living being on the operating table. My friend, you've come to me for treatment? The werewolf started to get up, disappointed he hadn't managed to elicit a scream, but the plague doctor reached out a hand to stop him, and that was curtains for that particular actor. As soon as the plague doctor's gloved hand made contact with the man in the werewolf costume, his heart stopped. Oh dear, the plague doctor remarked. Do not fear, I have the cure. You'll be alright in no time at all. By the time the rest of the actors came to see what had happened to the werewolf, there was a real zombie in the haunted house. Then, it was pure chaos. Actors running and screaming, knocking over props and abandoning their seasonal gig, darting between customers as they went, shrieking, Don't go in there! It's real! Naturally, this only made them want to check it out even more. But by the time they got inside, there was no sign of the Plague Doctor. Only one very lost zombie in a werewolf costume. A few jars broken in all the chaos, and footsteps in the dry grass outside, leaving town. Days 8 to 18. The Plague Doctor spent all of his eighth day on the run, walking once more. He was starting to get used to this, the endless drudgery of the path to freedom. He hated to admit it, but he was almost starting to miss his cell back at the foundation, the routine of it, the quiet time to work, the three meals given to him each day, even though he didn't need to eat to survive. He missed food and drink, the simple pleasures of bread, meat, cheese, fruit, a mug of tea, a cup of wine. He sighed to himself wistfully. Then he caught a whiff of something lovely. He lifted his beak, taking in another deep breath. The unmistakable scent of roast pheasant, hearty and warm. Beneath it, something else. Mold wine, spiced and inviting. Smells that reminded him of home, of days long lost. He couldn't be certain where it would lead, or if there would be a seat for him at the table, but he couldn't resist following the heavenly aroma to its source. As he drew closer to the smell of food and merriment, he could hear music, the plucking of a lyre, the high trill of a flute, singing and clapping. Then he finally spotted it. Rows of colorful tents, long banquet tables, minstrels wandering about and playing ballads to anyone who would listen, men, women, and children frolicking in elaborate costumes, plate armor, robes, gowns, and more. Though the plague doctor didn't know how to describe what he was seeing, he had wandered onto the site of one of the state's largest renaissance fairs. It just so happened to be opening day, and he was just in time for the celebratory feast. Good day, doctor. A nobleman tipped his hat to SCP-049. Are you speaking to me? The plague doctor was taken aback by the recognition. Why, of course. You're the only doctor I see. Her Majesty the Queen thanks you for your service, for keeping us all safe from the Great Plague. The Plague Doctor had no idea that this man was an actor, playing along with him in what he assumed was a scene for the tourists. Instead, he took the words to heart, swelling with pride and gratitude for the recognition. Good sir, it is my duty and my honor. The Plague Doctor nodded politely. Luckily for him, and unbeknownst to the rest of the cast of players at the fair, the man originally hired to play the town plague doctor had booked a commercial role that morning and decided not to go in to work. 
The man's choice not to call and let anyone know, though rude, led to a fortuitous misunderstanding for SCP-049. Please, join us at the royal table. The nobleman made a sweeping gesture with his arm, inviting the doctor to sit and dine with him and the rest of the actors playing members of the court. Thank you for your kindness. If he could, the plague doctor would have smiled. He dined to his heart's content that afternoon, listening to sounds of music and laughter. He slotted into his role at the fair even better than his position at the haunted house. He answered questions from tourists about his work as a physician, warned them of the dangers of the great pestilence, and posed for the occasional photograph. He spent a wonderful ten days living in a stylized artificial version of the past, basking in the warm glow of camaraderie. Though the other actors wondered why he never took his mask off, even to eat. Then, sadly, it was time for the fair to pack up for the season. The plague doctor bid his new friends farewell, and declined their offers to exchange numbers and keep in touch. He would, however, always remember them fondly. Days 19 through 41. As he was departing the fairgrounds, the doctor caught a glimpse of strange men approaching some of the actors, showing federal badges and asking them questions. He couldn't be certain that it was the foundation, but it was more than enough to make him cautious. He would have to retreat into the woods once more and stay out of sight. He laid low for quite some time, for 22 days to be exact. But then, on day 41, day 41 to 52, it started to snow. White blanketed the forest floor, soft and cold. The weather wouldn't kill him, of course, but it was uncomfortable. He would need to find some more efficient shelter to escape from the elements before the winter storm worsened. He trudged through the snow into a new town, small and quaint. There was an abandoned church at the edge of the main road, a bit broken down, but the roof held firm against the onslaught of ice and wind. So the plague doctor made it his new home for the next 12 days, working quietly and staying out of sight. Day 53 to 57. On the eve of the plague doctor's 53rd day on the run from the SCP Foundation, he was stirred from his work by the sound of a choir of beautiful voices outside. He looked to find a group of Christmas carolers singing together, the rows of houses along the streets covered in colorful lights and glittering decorations. Wanting to get a little closer to the music, the doctor left his hiding spot for the first time in nearly two weeks. But as the choir saw a strangely shaped dark shadow emerging from the abandoned church, they screamed and scattered in every direction. One of them yelled something about the Krampus as they went. Frightened by the whole interaction, SCP-049 found himself a new spot under a bridge. It was cold but isolated, at least it was, for five days. Day 58 on day 58, a group of local teenagers, rowdy and looking to make some trouble, spotted the plague doctor squatting under the bridge. They pelted him with snowballs, laughing. Before he could do anything about it, fortunately for the teens, they then ran back to their car and sped away. Drenched in ice and cold water, miserable and irritated, the plague doctor searched for another place to stay. Day 59 to Day 84 The plague doctor was able to slip into another relatively quiet building the local community theater, which happened to be an old opera house repurposed as the site of volunteer-run musicals. While the townsfolk began rehearsals for the production of The Phantom of the Opera, the plague doctor watched from above, hiding in the shadows. Every so often, the stagehand would catch a glimpse of a cape, the silhouette of a face, a pair of dark eyes, but no one believed her when she tried to tell them that the phantom was real. At least until a handyman went up into the rafters to install some lights and saw the plague doctor for himself. Then it was time for him to flee to a new town. Day 85 to Day 89 On Day 85, the plague doctor climbed up onto the roof of a dark house to avoid a particularly aggressive dog and let himself in through the attic window. The next morning, a little girl came up into the attic in search of a lost toy and found him there. He waited for her to scream, but she didn't. She introduced herself as Abby and asked if he would like some cookies and milk. He accepted her gracious offer, and the two visited with each other for several days until Abby's parents asked who she was talking to. They didn't take it well when she answered, the Birdman in the attic. Day 90 on day 90, Abby's parents called the police, who had been warned to look out for a man in a bird mask, and got in touch with their contacts at the SCP Foundation. Feeling the authorities closing in, SCP-049 took to the wilderness once more. Day 91 to Day 99 
Though the air was still painfully cold, the plague doctor managed to set up camp, using tools from his bag to build a fire and construct a makeshift tent. He stayed there for three days, before intending to move on and throw the foundation off of his trail, but he was slowed by the appearance of a group of hikers, bundled up against the winter weather and exploring the woods. Afraid he couldn't trust them, the doctor touched one to convince him to leave. The man fell to the ground dead, and as his companions ran away screaming, the doctor vowed to cure him. Working against the inopportune conditions, it took him five more days to reanimate the hiker. On day 100 of his time on the lamb, the foundation finally closed in. The plague doctor was just stitching up a large incision in his patient's chest when he heard the click of a gun behind him. Come with us peacefully, and we won't have to sedate you, the officer said. With a heavy sigh, the plague doctor held up his hands, stepping back from his patient just as its undead body sat up, blinking its unseeing eyes. Very well, I will go back. To tell you the truth, gentlemen, this has all been a bit too much trouble. I could use the rest. Somewhere, caught between parallel dimensions, is the containment breach to end all containment breaches. Countless unnumbered and nameless anomalies on a warpath to destroy what has become of a now unrepentantly evil foundation. A testing site rendered distorted and unstable under the power of countless reality warping objects. And me, caught in the middle of it. You're probably wondering how I got here. Well, for starters, I'm what's known as an anomaly. If I can see something, I can crush it using my brain. I guess you'd say I'd have a form of telekinesis, but fine control or remote levitation are not my forte. I'm not sure who I was before the GOC apprehended and brought me here to this strange place. A place ruled by a cruel man named Elliot Emerson and the even crueler foundation that he directed. A place called Site 13. And as for the rest of us contained here, we don't get numbers. The only name I have is the one I gave myself. If I am destined to be trapped in this infernal place by a man named Emerson, I may as well self-identify as his equal and opposite. You can call me Thoreau. And this is the story how I managed to survive 100 days in Site 13. Well, after everything went haywire. <sighs> here goes nothing. Day 1. Like I said before, this all began with the containment breach to end all containment breaches. It is chaos in the hallways, with anomalies running rampant everywhere. Most are taking revenge on the guards and researchers, but not every one of the unnumbered is in solidarity. The crystal butterflies and the mimetic scribe are indiscriminately going after anything that isn't them, including each other. As for me, I'm wearing a specialized helmet that keeps me blindfolded. It's a power suppressant, since my anomalous ability only works on things I can see clearly. I'd love to remove it, but there's no way to find out which guard has clearance to deactivate my headgear when things are this manic. As much as I'd love to celebrate the reckoning of Site 13, I decided it was better to stay inside my cell for the day. Let the record show that if the Foundation or the GOC do crack down on this, I was well behaved during the breach. Day 2. It's gotten marginally quieter out there. I don't think the fighting has stopped as much as it has moved out of the halls where I've been contained. The Foundation hasn't dropped off any more rations today, so I start to think that maybe this really was the big one. What if everyone somehow got out? I started to wonder about some of my fellow anomalous humanoids and if the containment breach had given them a chance. I don't really know what they look like, because most of the time I am forced to wear a blindfold to suppress my powers, but I have been able to pick up a few hints through listening. There's a clown named Bobble. He was already here when I arrived. And no, he's not a guy dressed as a clown, but like a genuine, actual clown. He's nice enough, but I get the impression he'd be a bad influence on kids. If there were any here. Other than Elijah, of course. He's known as the Leech Boy since he can drain the blood from people with his hands. Ugh, scary stuff, really. I don't dislike either of them, but I'd rather not take my chances running into them during a containment breach. I guess I'll wait out this one a bit longer. I had water from the containment unit sink if I needed to satiate my thirst, and a day without a meal wasn't exactly something new. Day 3. I felt a strange rumbling in the air this morning. Like everything in the entire universe was picked up and dropped back down somewhere else. I don't know how else to describe it. I once heard some of the guards talking about a reality-bending machine called the Thresher on the lower levels. Could it be the work of that thing? Day 4. 
My old friend Bobble the Clown actually came through for me. He has taken up residence in the digital interface of my cell and is giving me details of what is happening out there. The funniest thing about this clown is that he lives inside of electronic devices. Bobble was never threatened by my abilities because they only work on the physical world. The most I could do to him is crush a television set where he was dwelling. Our friendship is based on the fact that the two of us are among the only things in Site 13 that couldn't cause harm to each other. And sadly, I think that my list of enemies is much higher than Bobble's, and a lot of the things out there might hold a grudge. The reason I haven't been thrown into the fire is that my matter compression ability is useful to the Foundation. I'm not proud to admit it, but I've agreed multiple times to use my abilities to bring some of my fellow anomalies, particularly the larger ones, down to a manageable size for disposal. My reward for this is that I'm not subject to some of the more deadly experiments here, though it's not like these evil unethical scientists can resist some light torture. Did I mention how much these people hate anomalies? Because make no mistake, they hate us a lot. Bobble said he couldn't stick around, but that there was an untouched supply of rations a few cells down that I, as an organism that needs to eat to survive, should go and find. Even with the blindfold, it shouldn't be too hard for me to get there. I'll think about going tomorrow. Day 5. As I felt my way through the hallway to the other cell, I could tell that things had gone really off the deep end. There were people fused into the walls, no doubt because of one of the other anomalies, and I had no idea whether or not they were on my side. There was no doubt that mimetic cognito hazards were scrawled all over the surfaces of the facility as well. If the scribe had truly been on the loose, he'd definitely have made those brain-destroying symbols he always did. Maybe my current lack of vision was a good thing, especially because spending so much of my time blindfolded had enhanced my sense of smell. From the inside of a nearby open cell, I caught wind of a tray of day-old Foundation rations. And what luck. They were the same kind usually given to humanoid anomalies like me. These must have been the ones that Bobble had mentioned. I settled into this new cell and enjoyed my first full meal in days. Day 6. With the power-suppressing device still firmly on my head, getting out of here seemed like a pipe dream. I spent the day thinking about the only other person in Site 13 who was kind to me, Dr. Hadley. She was a researcher who took care of some of the humanoid anomalies. Even though she's working with the Foundation, I get the feeling that she's actually a really good person deep down. Maybe it's the Stockholm Syndrome talking, but I really wish I could see her face. She always had sympathy for Elijah, the leech boy, and saw him as an ordinary kid despite his blood-draining powers. I can only hope that both of them are safe. Day 7 I continued to make my way across the facility, hugging the wall as tightly as I could. I could hear weapon fire throughout the facility and countless anomalies battling it out. All of a sudden, I was caught off guard when I heard several footsteps coming towards me. These must have been Foundation personnel, I thought. A shot rang out, and I was hit directly in my headgear by some kind of piercing round. Fortunately, the suppression device was strong enough to take the hit for me, so I didn't take direct damage, and it was equally fortunate that being shot at had caused it to malfunction. I could now remove the headgear and blindfold, and stare down the group of armed Foundation guards in front of me. It's the Crusher! One of them shouted. My name is Thoreau, I responded. I didn't give them a chance to fire again, and using my ability to defend myself was the only way out. After all the anomalies I had compressed at their orders, doing the same to Emerson's forces came all too naturally. To them, we were merely objects, things to be used up before we're incinerated. Whether we're human, inhuman, or something entirely indescribable, it made no difference to Emerson and his underlings, since all of us are going to the same place. After that encounter with the guards, I decided that I wouldn't use my powers to harm my fellow anomaly. We had all endured so much in Site 13 that it felt needlessly brutal to let the one thing that I had in common with the other prisoners be a weapon against them. I couldn't guarantee that all the other anomalies would treat me the same way, but the idea of living by that principle filled me with a sense of purpose. From now on, it was me against Site 13. I would survive and escape to the outside world. Day 8. To my surprise, there was a mundane vending machine in this terrible place. I used my powers to break into it, raking in the delicious bounty of chips, protein bars, and fruit snacks. 
This stash would take care of my sustenance needs for a while, so I stored them in a military pack I had taken from one of the guards I had fought with the other day. Day 9, I began to realize that the rooms I was traveling through were repeating themselves. It was hard to really notice at first, with all the cognito hazards I was trying to avoid, but it seemed like Site 13 was reshuffling itself in a way that had made my progress through it completely circuitous. While this meant that my encounters with dangerous anomalies and guards had been basically non-existent, it also meant that I wasn't making any progress towards escape. Day 10 through 14. Yep, I'm officially stuck in a loop now. This was probably unavoidable, even if I had a mental map of the facility or even a physical map. Reality is so broken by the effects of the Thresher that I don't really know if the rest of Site 13 even still exists. I honestly wouldn't be that upset if Director Emerson and the rest of the Foundation personnel had been flung into oblivion. That would be worth it, even if I spent the rest of my days here wandering around and eating vending machine food. Day 15. I gained access to a new area of the facility, only to find that it was a stairwell filled with a terrifyingly black, gooey substance. I had no idea what this stuff was, but perhaps it was best not to touch it. Yeah, that would definitely be for the best. Still, there were stairs going away from the goo, which could lead me closer to an exit, so I decided to take that risk and sprint up to a higher level. As if waiting for a cue, the liquid began to rise as soon as I set foot in the stairwell. I climbed the stairs as fast as I could, for this stuff was determined. I thought I could slow it down by crushing some of the stairs, but using my powers caused some of the substance to splash onto my hand. It didn't hurt, freaky, but it definitely could have been worse. I made it out of the stairwell otherwise intact, and thankfully the new floor I found myself on wasn't anywhere that I'd been before. There were giant leeches everywhere, crawling through cracks in the wall. Did Elijah do this? Day 16 through 27. I continued making my way through the unexplored sections, encountering a lot of the remains of dead guards, but no fellow anomalies beside the leeches. I made a point of not getting too close to them, and they didn't seem to bother me either. Most of the leeches seemed content to drink the blood from the corpses of which there were plenty. There were fewer cognito hazards, and I was grateful for that. I managed to find and crush a few more vending machines to restock my food supplies. Compared to the rations I had been fed since I was first brought here, these snacks practically tasted like gourmet food. On day 28, Bobble found me again, or rather, I found him. He was inside of a laptop in one of the abandoned research offices. We compared notes, and it gave me some idea of what happened that caused so many of us to escape. Apparently, Dr. Hadley had stood up to Emerson and sabotaged the incinerator. I guess she truly was a good person. I'll have to thank her personally if I happen to find her still alive somewhere in all of this. It could have also been her who activated the Thresher machine, but I wouldn't put it past Emerson to do the same. Of course, he would have done so in an effort to take the rest of us with him. Isn't it remarkable that the person we think we can trust and the people who hold us prisoner might wind up taking the same action for completely different reasons? It could be that my embarrassing little crush on Dr. Hadley was stopping me from seeing the bigger picture. In any case, I thanked Bobble and pressed onward. Day 29 through 39. While the reshuffling of the hallways and rooms had considerably slowed down my exploration of Site 13, I can safely say that I'm making progress towards finding some kind of way out. I've come to realize that the further I get from the lower levels where the Thresher is at, it's most powerful, the more stable the facility's layout becomes. If I can make it to the rooftop, then I'm as good as free. So my guiding philosophy has become onwards and upwards. Day 40. Now this is unexpected. I was confronted by another group of armed Foundation personnel, different uniforms. One of the mobile task forces, I think. But instead of shooting me, they just started asking questions. The most confusing of which was, What is your object class and SCP designation number? I had no idea how to answer. Were things that different in the other containment sites? Site 13 had never given us numbers or formal classifications beyond simple nicknames derived from our anomalous properties. I wasn't sure what was going on, but I also didn't want to risk getting put back into containment. I couldn't be sure this wasn't some kind of foundation trick, 
or I hadn't somehow lost my mind because of some cognito hazard I'd accidentally glimpsed. I crushed a doorway using my powers and ran for it. A few shots echoed behind me, but the apparent leader of the mobile task force called for them to hold their fire. Whoever these people were, they definitely weren't with Emerson. Day 41 through 52. If the leeches, repeating staircases, and occasional hostile anomalies weren't enough, now I have to deal with these alternate Foundation personnel poking around here. It was one thing to protect myself from Site-13's dedicated guards, since they'd been responsible for holding me captive, but my conscience was telling me not to attack these new Mobile Task Force agents. Instead, I hid from them as well as I could, running to another area whenever I was discovered. I can't remember where I heard it from, but I know there's some old saying about great power and great responsibility. Point is, I didn't want to have the responsibility of having used my powers to hurt people who didn't deserve it. Still, it seemed like many of the anomalies didn't feel the same way. From what I observed during my circuitous route around the facility, I could tell that these Mobile Task Force agents were suffering losses. Day 53 On Day 53, I found a lone agent huddled in a fetal position against the wall of one of the containment corridors. It seemed that no other members of their squad were present, so either they had been separated in the madness of Site-13, or they were the sole survivor. Either way, I felt sympathetic, so I approached them in an effort to communicate. What I learned during this conversation absolutely blew my mind. It turned out that the Thresher activation had caused Site-13 to literally jump universes and wind up in a timeline where the Foundation and the GOC had never joined forces. In this reality, the Foundation was a comparatively benevolent organization that only sought to secure, contain, and protect anomalies. It rarely destroyed anomalous beings unless those beings posed an existential threat to other life. According to the agent I spoke to, if a humanoid anomaly like me were to be contained by this version of the organization, I'd most likely be given free room and board and three meals a day. Even if freedom was my ultimate goal, I couldn't say that life didn't tempt me. I agreed to help this Foundation agent find the rest of their team, as long as they were telling the truth. Day 54 through 67. The Mobile Task Force agent and I worked together to search the facility for other Foundation personnel. Not ones on the payroll of Site-13, I should clarify. It was nice having someone to talk to, even if they recoiled in fear when I mentioned my best friend was a clown. I guess a lot of people in this dimension have an irrational fear of clowns. By the way, my new friend said that their name was Agent Ben McDowell, and apparently Site-13 was the most dangerous site that their force had ever been deployed into. I couldn't say that I was honored, especially after all this place had put me through. But the nightmare was far from over, because on day 68, oh god, day 68, the leeches surrounded us and were out for blood. Agent McDowell had only limited ammunition, and I was still incredibly hesitant to use my powers on other anomalies. Of course, my resolve was about to be pushed to its breaking point, as an enormous mutated leech arrived at our location. It was the biggest anomaly I'd ever seen, and yet there was something uncannily familiar about it. Elijah, could it be? The Super Leech lashed out at Agent McDowell with its huge tentacles and pulled them into its terribly toothy mouth. I ran away as fast as I could. Should I have felt bad that I had left my new ally behind with a giant monstrous anomaly? Yes, I was only human after all. But self-preservation had kicked in at the time, and my mind hadn't fully accepted that I should be protecting someone dressed in the Foundation uniform over another anomaly. I'm sorry, Agent McDowell. At the very least, I won't forget your kindness. Days 69 through 84. I was on my own again, wandering through the facility as it twisted and changed, trapped in a dimension that wasn't my own, with freedom feeling even less possible now that I knew there was an entirely different foundation after me now. I never saw Elijah again, or rather the horrific thing that Elijah had become. I made a guess, grimly, that Dr. Hadley was probably gone by now. So many lives had been lost because of the cruelty of Site Director Elliot Emerson. If I found him, I would make sure that he paid for the hell he put us through. Day 85. On day 85, I did find him. There he was, screaming as he was pulled along the wheel-like face of a terrifying many-armed god. I couldn't stare too long because the wheel was covered in ruins that were cognito hazards, but I got a good enough look. 
The man responsible for all of this was now being tormented himself. I wouldn't have been capable of a better punishment on my own, so I left him to his fate. Day 86 through 100. It took me 15 more days of searching for staircases before I made it to the rooftop of Site 13. When I got there, a Foundation helicopter was waiting for me. And fortunately, it was the foundation of this new dimension. One that would provide me food and shelter for me like a human deserves, and never subject me to experiments against my will. As I watched Site 13 get farther away from inside the helicopter, a smile crossed my face for the first time in 100 days. I made it? I, I actually made it? I'm still alive. By some miracle, or maybe by sheer luck, I made it to the end of my sentence. Over three months of the most horrific work I've ever had to do with no other alternative. But it's paid off, because any minute now, they'll be coming into the dorm to let me go. I can walk out of here with my head up. I can't wait to get out of these orange overalls that I've had to live in since I arrived. It seems like so much longer in all honesty. The only way I've been able to keep track of how many days I've been stuck here is by putting tally marks on the wall next to my dormitory bed. One. Hundred. I've been a member of D-Class personnel for the SCP Foundation for the last 100 days. And here's how I survived. They didn't waste any time early on. I'll give the Foundation that. I'd barely been out of my sentencing hearing for a few days. Put on trial and convicted for a crime I didn't even commit. There had been a string of murders, and someone who had either been involved or was responsible laid the blame on me. But whoever they were, they had powerful friends. The cops were in on it, planting evidence to frame me and make me look like I was guilty when I was really innocent. That's what landed me in prison, serving a sentence of 25 years to life behind bars. And it was during my first week of incarceration that he showed up. The recruitment specialist. A clean-cut, blunt Agent Smith type came to visit me. I hadn't even been in prison long enough to have visitor privileges, but the shady agent seemed to know which strings to pull in order to ask me an important question. What would you do to get out of here? He'd said. To which my answer was, anything. That was my first mistake. Immediately the next day I received a letter detailing more about what exactly Agent Smith was offering. It was folded and hidden in the spine of a book that a guard handed me during reading hour. Unfolding the message, it all felt like an old-school covert spy tactic. To Mr. Emil Carker, the letter read. We understand that you've recently received a criminal conviction. There are two options currently before you, as detailed below. One, you can serve out the remainder of your sentence in prison. Or two, you can be released into the care of our organization. While with us, you will be helping to further scientific advancements through hard work. We have devised a system that allows convicts such as yourself to perform a vital role within our organization in a return for a reduction in their prison sentences. We have no interest in or intention of determining any guilt for the crimes for which you are currently convicted. We merely seek to present this opportunity for you. We ask that you destroy this letter once you have finished reading. Should you be interested in our offer, then please recite the phrase, it's a yes, to a prison guard with the badge number 47890. Naturally, as cryptic an offer like that was, I didn't need much time to mull it over. I was trapped in prison for something I didn't do, with no way to appeal for my freedom or prove my innocence. So, taking up a mysterious job opportunity from a shadowy group seemed like a much better alternative at the time. After all, I could either work off my sentence through employment, or rot away in a cell for the next two and a half decades at minimum. All I had to do next was find the right guard. I, I tried not to make it obvious that I was eyeing every prison guard's badge number as they stood around, keeping a close eye on me and the other inmates. But it was while I was out in the yard that I saw him, number 47890. I'd gone to bed with a knot in my stomach. Hours earlier, I had done exactly as the letter said and approached the guard, making sure I was close enough for him to hear me, but trying to make it clear that I wasn't looking to start any trouble either. I it's a yes, I told him. In response, 47890 had furrowed his brow and scrunched his mustache, seemingly in disgust. Back up, inmate, he commanded sharply. I backed away with my hands raised, confused as to what just happened. I spent the entire rest of the day thinking about it. Maybe the note had been a prank, some kind of initiation, seeing as I was the newest prisoner. But that didn't explain the agent who had shown up before. What was going on? The questions that were spinning around in my head eventually wore me out. And while I slept, that's when someone put a bag over my head, drugged me, and snuck me out of prison. When I woke up, I was somewhere new, a room filled with other convicts. 
although not many of them seemed to have come from the same prison I had been sentenced to. Plenty were sporting different jumpsuits, but their gruff demeanors told me all I needed about them. I was surrounded by a more violent breed of criminal, some of the worst of the absolute worst. The atmosphere in this pen full of murderers and monsters was so tense that it felt like the slightest accidental bump could explode into a full-blown fight. Suddenly, a hatch in the ceiling opened, and a pile of clothing came thumping down from above. It was a mass of orange, enough matching overalls for every inmate in the room. Of course, I held back from the initial clamor some of the others made, grabbing their new prison garb, snatching orange overalls from each other and arguing. When I eventually got mine, I noticed an unfamiliar logo emblazoned on the front of the uniform. After being made to wait a whole day in the pen, the other prisoners and I were filed out of the room by heavily armed security guards. We were all directed towards a hall. Nobody was daring enough to challenge the officers, even the more violent among the prisoners. I spotted that the guards' uniforms bore the same insignia as the overalls we'd been made to wear. It must have been the logo of the mysterious organization that had offered me employment. We were given an orientation talk led by someone who introduced themselves as a junior assistant researcher. They explained that our current location was highly classified, as was the true identity of the group that had arranged for us to be released. All we were told was that this was an unspecified form of research facility, and that we had to cooperate with the facility staff if we wanted to secure our release. It seemed straightforward enough, although the junior assistant researcher seemed to make a lot of jokes about us dying during these tests. I think they hoped it would alleviate some of the tension. It, it didn't. After sitting through the orientation talk, I still had more questions than answers. The one thing I had learned was that being tattooed hurt. Exiting the hall, the other prisoners and I had been directed to get a designation number tattooed on our wrist and across our chest. When someone had asked why the chest, the researcher conducting orientation had answered, Well, in the event of an explosion, it's most likely that it will be the largest intact chunk of meat left. This was another one of their jokes. Still feeling sore as my tattoo healed, I read the number now permanently inked onto my body. D2152. D-Class Personnel. That's what they call this now. We were directed into a dormitory, a lot less cramped than my old cell. But still, being surrounded by violent criminals when I knew I didn't belong there, it felt no less isolating. One of them, who took the bunk next to mine, introduced himself to me as Shiv, where he might try to kill me. I did my best to be friendly towards him. Shiv and I didn't exactly bond, but more sprung up conversations because there was little else to do. I was still worried about some of the flippin' comments made about all of us dying, until he pointed out something far stranger. Don't you wonder why they're making us all wait? He asked. And the moment he mentioned it, I did start to wonder about that. It seemed odd that this organization had wasted little time in getting us all here. It had only been a week ago that I entered my prison cell for the first time, and now I was here. I think it's their way of telling us, Shiv went on, that we aren't here to be helpful, to be a workforce for them. They brought us all here to die. That comment made me look around and actually acknowledge the people I was trapped with. They were some of the worst criminals imaginable, irredeemable killers. Would this organization really let those people back out into the world after helping out with a few tests? I'd soon find out, because day eight was the last before I found myself working directly for the SCP Foundation. I picked up the name from a few places around the facility. Name tags, lab coats, and security uniforms, always with the same logo. Me and the other D-Class personnel were woken up early in the morning by a bell and issued with assignments. From the very first day the work started, I noticed that not all the others came back to the dorm at the end of the day. Shiv was one of those. My tasks mostly consisted of cleaning up with a mop, hosing down empty testing chambers that had a worrying amount of blood sprayed all over the walls and floors. The regiments were strict, and I made sure to do exactly what was asked of me to avoid causing any trouble. It felt like a lot like being back in prison, but with the only added caveat of being able to move around the facility, even if it was to go and wipe up the Foundation's mess. Although the other classes of personnel didn't seem to take kindly to my help, making snide comments as they passed me in the hallways. We'd been told not to address the other staff unless spoken to, which was frustrating. I certainly had a few things I would have liked to say to them. After two and a half weeks without so much as a hint of any trouble, I was given my first testing assignment that wasn't just cleaning up. You would think that would be exciting, but having seen some of the carnage left behind after other tests, I was anything but eager to take part. Luckily for me, and pretty surprisingly, my first test was pretty straightforward. I was shown to a room containing a white bowl decorated with light blue flowers that researchers referred to as SCP-348. I received a nasty splinter from my mop's handle the day before, 
and was instructed to sit down and eat from the bowl, which was filled with soup. Naturally, I eagerly ate it, despite how bitter it tasted. It was better than the food from the D-Class canteen, at least. But when I finished, I noticed a message had appeared at the bottom of SCP-348. It read, I don't believe you were framed. Goodbye, son. After that, it was as if the floodgates had been opened, and every day I was asked to do another test with a new SCP. Most were harmless anomalous creatures or objects, like one of the bigger experiments I was involved in, which focused on SCP-999, this friendly little gelatinous orange blob. Electrodes were hooked up to me while I just calmly sat in a room with SCP-999. Being around it made me feel great, the best I'd felt since arriving and joining D-Class. Although I did hear one of the other researchers making a comment that SCP-999 was, quote, not ready yet, whatever that meant. Even so, the Tickle Monster had given me a new positive outlook on my role at the Foundation. It was odd work, but I could find a rhythm to it that would hopefully make the time pass by a little quicker. And if it meant getting out, it was worth all the dirty looks from other classes of personnel. This was an outlook I didn't want to lose. After a month, we were told to take a pill that the guards handed out to us. Something called an amnestic that would make us all forget the previous month. But wanting to hang on to my newfound optimism, I secretly flushed mine down a toilet. In hindsight, I should have taken it. My next big test quickly brought me down a peg. I was handed a katana, SCP-572, and instantly felt like I was unstoppable. The sword made me believe I was a powerful warrior, and if I could maybe fight my way out of the Foundation facility with ease. Unfortunately, the moment I tried to use it didn't lead to freedom. I had an accident, broke my arm, and suffered a series of internal fractures, all while the research team mocked me. Embarrassed, I felt like a total laughingstock. Things only got worse from there. I'd barely set foot outside of the infirmary before a different team of personnel told me I was going to be assisting them with an important task. They dragged me to an old wooden door after briefly explaining what was going on, although I struggled to keep up. Beyond the door, which they called SCP-2317, was a vast salt plain. Following their instructions, I acted as an assistant to the rest of the team as they performed a strange ritual. I had to scatter a mix of holy water and chicken blood around a circle of seven stone pillars, then recite, Blood for the old gods, water for the new king. It was an unusual practice, to say the least, but apparently I was helping keep a powerful vengeful demigod imprisoned. That did little to soften the news that I heard when we returned through SCP-2317. When I was gone, one of the Foundation's security team had been infected by something known as SCP-2193. A phenomenon that makes people believe that every month, a large group of D-Class are to be terminated. When I heard, I actually considered taking my amnestic for this month to forget just how many had been killed. It had been a whole two months since I had actively started work as part of D-Class personnel, and there weren't many of my fellow prisoners left. I was sent for a mandatory psychological evaluation. The Foundation wanted to know if I would still be able to perform tests for them. I doubted it came from a place of actual concern. It's not like they cared all that much if the things I had seen were taking a toll on me. Sitting across from a researcher performing my evaluation, I did my best impression of a normal person. I had to pretend like none of it was getting to me. All the horrors and the close brush I'd almost had with death by monthly termination, I wouldn't have lied about it normally, but I'd been told I had a month left before I was due to be released. Apparently not many D-Class made it that far, given the dangerous nature of testing. All I could think about was how good it would feel to eat real food again. I started to daydream about getting a cheeseburger on my first day out. Almost instantly, my hopes of freedom were dashed the very next day. I was told I'd be going on a longer assignment. This time it would be an expedition into an anomalous location called SCP-432. The Foundation researchers outfitted me with a flashlight, plus extra batteries. A headset and a microphone linked to their control center were placed over my ear along with a camera unit mounted on my shoulder. They said it would wirelessly transmit back to them, and they'd see what I saw. I was also given a couple bottles of water, some energy bars, and a few sticks of luminous marker chalk. But when they had said anomalous location, the last thing I'd been expecting was to climb into a rusty metal cabinet. The next two weeks were like living inside a nightmare. Inside the cabinet was a huge maze, a literal labyrinth all made out of the same rusted steel of the exterior of SCP-432. It was so dark even with the use of my flashlight and the few light bulbs affixed to some of the walls within the cabinet maze. Before long, I ended up losing my bearings and lost with no way out. But being trapped in the maze and the dark wasn't even the worst part. There was something else in the labyrinth. 
some kind of creature lurking through the metal corridors. My flashlight eventually ran out of power, so I never actually saw it, but every time I tried to sleep I just lay awake listening to its growls. I couldn't help but think what kind of horrible thing was out there and might be looming over me in the dark. Even when I opened my eyes, I still wouldn't get to see it. Eventually another D-Class was sent into SCP-432. By some miracle, he was able to not only find me, but guide me back to the entrance of the cabinet maze. The moment I was free, I yelled at the research team demanding they let me go. I didn't just mean let out of SCP-432, I meant free from D-Class, from the Foundation, from all of it. I was sent for another psyche evaluation and deemed to be fine, just suffering from heightened stress. When they had asked me if I'd been taking my amnestics, I lied and I told them yes. Ten days before I was set to be released, and they couldn't help but assign me to one last test. Don't worry, a researcher sarcastically assured me. This one will be nice and easy on you. You'll just have to jump into a paddling pool. You can do that, can't you, D2152? The paddling pool in question was SCP-120. Every time a different glow emanated from it, I was instructed to jump into it. The exact second I did, I found myself transported somewhere new. I got the Himalayas on my first go, Greenland and the Sahara Desert on the next two tries. Every one of the locations I ended up at had some kind of foundation facility established nearby. They'd pick me up and I'd be taken right back to SCP-120 to continue testing. It felt like I was being deliberately, intentionally tortured. The Foundation was giving me these momentary glimpses of freedom every time I was transported by SCP-120. It was a carrot on the end of the stick that they were keeping just out of my reach and I hated it. It made me realize that I had never been there to work for them. Being part of D-Class personnel wasn't a job. All I was to them was a human lab rat. But now it's my last day. They promised me by the end of day today I wouldn't be here anymore. I just want to be out. Done with D-Class for good. The Foundation researchers have given me one last simple test to do before I go. They said if I do, then I'll be gone. All they wanted me to do is wear this amulet for someone named Dr. Bright. How hard can that be? And they said they let me go after this one thing, so can't be anything that bad, right? R right? It doesn't feel quite real to say this, but mission accomplished. I did it. I actually made it through. My extraction is currently en route, and once they're here, I'll be heading back to the SCP Foundation. It doesn't feel like a hundred days since this all started. If anything, it feels like a lot longer. But it's done now. The mission is finally over. And now the real work begins. I'll be taken in for debriefing when I arrive, so I'd better get my story straight before the transport gets here. Here's how I survived 100 days infiltrating the Chaos Insurgency. It started with a message. A direct request passed down straight to me from the O5 Council themselves. I was shocked initially to receive any communication from them. The Council were hardly hands-on bosses, preferring to coordinate the Foundation from a station far, far above mine. I was part of a mobile task force, used to being out in the field, so when I got the message saying the Council wanted to talk to me, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. I went through various stages of reaction in my head, first being honored that they had singled me out, then that turned to worry. Had I done something wrong, or was this some kind of dismissal from the Foundation? Was it a performance review? When it finally came time for me to stand before the O5 Council, the last thing I was expecting to hear was that they had selected me specifically for a dangerous undercover assignment. Of course, I'd heard of the Chaos Insurgency before. Although I was yet to actually encounter them in the field, the MTFs were all instructed to keep up to date on who the Foundation's enemies were. As a group of interest, it wasn't hard to see why they were such a threat. A heavily armed clandestine organization with goals of weaponizing SCPs and achieving world domination. They sounded like lunatics, but dangerous lunatics all the same. This was the first step in my mission. Know your enemy. I was instructed to familiarize myself with the Chaos Insurgency, to understand them inside and out. While the MTF agent in me wanted to just get boots on the ground and start the real work, this operation needed a different approach. And so I hit the books, or to put it more accurately, I began scouring the SCP Foundation's database for any and all intel on the insurgency. All I could do was sit and read. Within 48 hours of being given my assignment, I felt like I knew everything about the Chaos Insurgency back to front, sideways, upside down, and pretty much any and every way possible. So imagined how disheartened I felt when I reported my research to the O5 Council, only to be told that I hadn't done enough. Hardly the best feeling. I won't deny it stung to hear that my day of research wasn't adequate prep for my assignment. But the Council did have an important point. 
This was a covert, deep cover infiltration into one of the most dangerous groups that opposed the Foundation. Purely memorizing all manner of facts and figures about the insurgency, learning of all their tactical capabilities, reading up on the various rumors about how they were founded, all that was just knowledge. If I wanted to pass myself off as a part of the Chaos Insurgency and avoid detection, knowing wasn't enough. I had to think like one of them. The timeline of the mission began to accelerate rapidly. I would have to train myself to believe the insurgency's core beliefs as I went along. Events weren't going to wait for me to be ready. The Council informed me that they were aware of a double agent working for the Chaos Insurgency from within the SCP Foundation itself. Obviously, I had heard rumors that there were operatives embedded within the ranks of the Foundation, but what was more surprising was that the O5 Council seemed to already know who these agents were. I'd always assumed that these insurgents kept their identities a secret, so hearing that a particular researcher, Dr. Parsons, was a known Chaos Insurgency conspirator and still had a job at the Foundation was both startling and worrying. But he provided me a way in and I assume that's why the O5 Council allowed the insurgency's double agents to remain as, quote, undetected as they thought they were. It meant they could be used as tools for the Foundation's benefit to get at the insurgency, that they were double agents after all. Dr. Parsons was due to be at the same Foundation site I was stationed at for only a few days. The upside of working directly on the orders of the Council meant that they had the administrative reach to pull all the necessary strings to get this duplicitous double agent in the right place for me to intercept him, but not for long. The window of opportunity was only a small one. I had a short time to get close enough to Parsons and get him to put me in contact with his friends at the Chaos Insurgency. Of course, I had to be tactful about it. If I came on too strong, there was a strong chance the double agent would easily detect that something was off and that his cover had been blown. So the plan was simple. Strike up a conversation with the spy in a way that wouldn't arouse suspicion and would compel him to assist my joining the Chaos Insurgency. Actually, simple might not have been the right word. The day of my confrontation with Parsons, I was uncontrollably nervous. I could feel myself shaking and silently hoped that it wasn't noticeable to anyone looking at me. The mess hall was decided as the best place I could drum up some kind of conversation with him. As I picked up my food tray, I spotted the doctor taking a seat in the far corner. Cautiously, I approached and asked if I could join him. In the back of my head, I kept reminding myself I had to play it casual. If I went in immediately with claiming I felt the Foundation should be run differently, then Parsons would smell the deception and the whole mission would come apart. So instead, I started small. We drummed up a conversation about the quality of the food the Foundation catering team had given us, or rather, the lack of quality. Then we chatted about containment procedures and various anomalies that we had each encountered in our different jobs. Lunch was wrapping up. We both finished our food, and I knew my window was about to close. And so I threw into conversation, you know, you ever get sick of the way they do things? The entire next day, I was on edge, worried that I'd thrown my assignment and alerted Parsons that the Foundation was aware of his ties to the insurgency. I didn't leave the task force barracks, confining myself to my quarters. If I left, there was always a slim chance of running into Dr. Parsons, or that the council would call me in to reprimand how I handled first contact. To my surprise, my paranoid thoughts were broken by a direct message from Parsons. He mentioned being intrigued by some of our conversation the previous day, and being disappointed I hadn't been in the mess hall this lunchtime to continue discussing certain aspects. It felt weirdly nice being friendly, only to then remember the man was a double agent for the Chaos Insurgency. His message went on to suggest we should meet in private in his office, and that's when the tension really hit me. Either he wanted me dead with no witnesses, or he had bought my line about disagreeing with the Foundation's methods. I arrived at Parsons' office at the agreed time, only to be welcomed warmly by the doctor. It was instantly disarming, and intentionally so, I tried not to fall for it, just in case he knew what I was really up to. But at the same time, I couldn't let it show. Dr. Parsons seemed to pick up our discussion from the other day, immediately talking about how the SCP Foundation would be better off putting anomalies to use rather than keeping them contained. I was surprised how brazen he was being. But then again, the Council knew he was a mole. Maybe they had bugged his office and he hadn't realized. Nodding along, pretending to agree with what the doctor was saying, 
The conversation quickly progressed. I told Parsons I felt the same, and it was frustrating to me as an MTF agent, seeing so many co-workers die in containment breaches against SCPs. That was the moment he mentioned he had some friends I should meet. The following night, they came for me while I slept in the barracks. I had no idea who had drugged me, although I suspected it was Dr. Parsons. He wasn't there when I woke up, though. In fact, I couldn't really tell who it was at first. The combination of the bag over my face and my head still reeling from whatever had knocked me out saw to that. Wherever I was, I didn't get to see it. There were figures near me, at least two, that much I could make out. Especially when the interrogation started. They were Chaos Insurgency. Their line of questioning told me that. Between punches and tasing, their questions range from what I was really up to, to whether the Foundation had sent me to infiltrate their organization. They'd anticipated the Council would use their own tactics against them, but every time, no matter how much pain they inflicted, I denied it. I wasn't a mole. I told them over and over again, I believed what they believed. After over a week of torture, the bag came off, and I was greeted by the sight of my captors in Chaos Insurgency tactical gear. They informed me that I had passed the initial phase of their recruitment process, and after suffering so much, that should have come as a relief. My mission to infiltrate them was progressing, but their interrogation had left me exhausted and in intense pain. The pair of insurgents made it very clear that I wasn't one of them, though. Not yet. In order to fully join their ranks, they wanted to send me on an operation with one of their armed detachments. If I complied with orders and made a deliberate act against the SCP Foundation, that would tell them that I was ready to become part of the Chaos Insurgency. If I refused or the mission was deemed to be a failure, it would mean an on-the-spot execution. Hiding my reluctance, knowing I wouldn't be able to forewarn the Foundation, I agreed. I spent the next several days with a new group of insurgency operatives. None of them gave me their names, nor any actionable intel I could pass on to the Council. I just had to refer to them by their various Gamma and Beta class numbers, their ranks within the Chaos Insurgency. The mission was an extraction, as part of their efforts to utilize anomalies. The insurgency would often launch violent raids on the Foundation to capture SCPs. Their target this time was SCP-2800, Cactus Man. He was mostly harmless save for his spines, but the group's leaders, Delta Command, wanted to force SCP-2800 to join their ranks. I had to treat it like any other operation with my MTF trying to force myself to forget that I was on the wrong side as we broke into the site containing SCP-2800. He didn't want to leave, but I hoped that the Foundation would eventually launch a countermission to rescue him. All that mattered for now was making the insurgency see that I could be helpful and useful to them. Sure enough, the Foundation did recover SCP-2800, and by the time they did, the Chaos Insurgency had already welcomed me into their ranks. I'd proven myself and that I shared their beliefs in utilizing the anomalies to realize their goals. During the mission, I had made it a point of showing my experience and skills as an MTF operative, hoping that would impress them. It seemed to have done the trick, as I was made a member of Beta Class, still under the command of Gamma and Delta Command above them. But it was a start, at least not as low in the chain as the Alpha Class were. They were the insurgency recruits with no experience dealing with anomalies, and who only joined to escape their miserable lives. Delta Command considered Alpha Class expendable, as if they were little more than cannon fodder. I couldn't help but feel bad for them, especially when I realized that the Foundation treated their D-Class exactly the same. Even the MTFs were mostly foot soldiers to them. Now established within the insurgency's ranks, I spent the next two weeks finding out everything I could about their operations and reporting back to the O5 Council through a secure, encrypted channel. Part of my infiltration mission was to see if I could locate the Engine, a mysterious anomalous artifact that had apparently influenced the earliest members of now Delta Command to form the Chaos Insurgency in the first place. There was no sign of the Engine anywhere in the compound I was stationed at. Then again, its location was likely a closely guarded secret. I did, however, encounter one of the anomalies within the insurgency's possession. It was SCP-1316, what appeared to be an ordinary and harmless kitten named Lucy. But in actuality, SCP-1316 was an intelligent and sophisticated listening device, used to spy on the Foundation and report back to the insurgency. I made sure to warn the Council the moment I found out. 
letting them know it wasn't just double agents being used to report on Foundation activity. Just as things were starting to form a regular pattern, things seemed to start going south. A few of my fellow insurgents seemed to mention things in conversation that made me start to feel paranoid. They weren't directly referencing me, but they talked openly about what they'd do if they found out the Foundation had tried to spy on the insurgency, and none of it was pleasant. I spent the rest of the day racked with worry. There was no way they could have known I was communicating with the O5 Council, or that the only reason I was there had been to gather intelligence on the Chaos Insurgency. It could have just been what people talked about here, although I couldn't shake my concern that maybe my cover had been blown that this was their subtle way of telling me the Chaos Insurgency was on to me. The worrying left me no choice, and I raised my concerns with the Council the first chance I got. Unfortunately, the response I received the following day did little to subdue my worries. The O5 Council contacted me, reminding me of the importance of my mission. I was to infiltrate and report back to them, find the engine or at least its location. There was an extraction planned, arriving in secret in a month's time. That was my time limit, and a warning came with it. If you cannot complete this assignment, then don't bother returning to the Foundation, the Council told me. If you are unsuccessful in carrying out your objectives, it will be taken as an act of sedition. We will consider you an active member of the Chaos Insurgency, and thus a threat to the Foundation. I was furious, not to mention scared out of my mind. The Council was willing to turn their backs on me if I couldn't deliver, and if the insurgency found out they had a mole in their ranks, then it sounded like they were ready to kill me on the spot. The insurgency were gearing up for another mission, this time a more aggressive attack on the Foundation as opposed to the stealthier extraction that I'd previously been on. Surprisingly, that put me more at ease. Sure, it'd be dangerous, but this was what I was good at. In the field, intensely combating anomalies. I could use this as an opportunity to regain some footing, remind the Chaos Insurgency what made me useful to them. Or so I thought. The mission was to capture SCP-682 and fit it with a piece of technology the Insurgency had tested on SCP-2394, a form of sapient tree frog. Their plan was that the device would enable them to control the hard-to-destroy reptile, meaning the Insurgency would have an unstoppable, adaptable killing machine in their arsenal. The attack on the Foundation site was a bloodbath. MTFs beset the insurgents on all sides, and as for 682, well, it wasn't exactly known for coming quietly without putting up a fight. Returning from the field after only a few days, I was confronted by a higher-up, a member of Gamma Class that oversaw the insurgency's operations. He told me that there had been numerous reports from other operatives that they hadn't seen me killing or even injuring Foundation personnel during the failed extraction of 682. It was true. I was still loyal to the Foundation, after all. The people working there were still my co-workers, even if I was pretending to be an insurgent. I deliberately missed shots, still using my weapon in the firefights with MTFs, but without causing them harm. I'd hoped nobody in the insurgency would notice, but it seemed they had. I brushed off the accusation, made some excuse about needing to go for an eye exam and contact lenses, but under the surface were relentless shudders of panic. In hindsight, the Gamma officer had told me this so the insurgency could see how I reacted, but at the time, I didn't realize, and that played right into their hand. The next day, I was caught while going to send an urgent SOS message to the O5 Council. Before I could reach the place, I stashed my encrypted comm device. A group of Chaos Insurgency Beta class operatives rushed me. I was bagged again, pulled away kicking and screaming, and unable to call for help. Over the next few days, it was like I'd been sent back in time to the start of my infiltration. As the insurgency tortured me again, I refused to give in, despite how much I wanted to just make the pain stop. But even then, it didn't matter. Their knowledge of the Foundation was greater than I realized, and the insurgents were easily able to crack the encryption of my comm unit. With that broken, they had access to all the messages I'd been sending to the O5 Council, and realizing who had sent me made them change their interrogation methods. The insurgents revealed something I hadn't heard before, something the Council had apparently kept a secret. The Chaos Insurgency had once been a part of the SCP Foundation. I refused to believe it at first, but with all I'd seen as an MTF agent, even my undercover mission, it started to make sense. An off-the-record Black Ops unit working for the O5 Council to circumvent the Ethics Committee. 
they'd grown disillusioned with how the Foundation handled its anomalies and broken away to form the Chaos Insurgency. When I accepted that to be true, the insurgents brought me to what I'd been sent for. They took me to the engine. Now I'm awaiting my extraction transport. After showing me the device that caused their earliest founders to splinter off from the Foundation, the Chaos Insurgency took me several miles from their compound to the coordinates the O5 Council had told me to be at. The Foundation think they're getting their agent back, and with me, plenty of intel on their enemies. But the engine showed me the truth, showed me the lies and fallacies of the Foundation, and especially the O5 Council. They think they're getting back their agent, but I serve the Chaos Insurgency now. It's hard to believe it's been a full 100 days since I began my journey. No, my mission into the beating heart of the SCP Foundation. I, Stathis Stern, risk detection, my safety, and even my own life for this cause. And I'm sure that makes you wonder why on earth I'd be foolhardy enough to put so much on the line. Well, my reason is the best. No, the only reason that matters. For the sake of art. I decided early on that recording my findings was essential, both for posterity and so that the art world may know just how dedicated I've been in my pursuit of true inspiration. It all started over three months ago. That was when I first managed to embed myself in the SCP Foundation. Naturally, I never would have jumped at the idea of having to fraternize with the likes of the Chaos Insurgency. Their methods are far too brutal, their organization seeped in violence that trivializes my own pursuit of a deeper meaning. But even I have to admit, the Insurgency's methodology can yield results. They arrange for a convenient accident to befall a lower-level researcher after they returned home from Site-19, the SCP Foundation's largest and most infamous facility, home to many of their equally infamous anomalies. Thanks to a falsified identity and phony transfer order from the insurgency, I was able to slip into Site-19 undetected so that I could begin my search. The subterfuge was, at first, easy to maintain. I looked the part, obviously. A lab coat and a name badge, so versatile and yet completely unassuming. I was visible and still imperceptible to the rest of the Foundation's personnel. As far as they knew, I was just the latest transfer to Site-19. As I spent the day getting my bearings, not one of them could have possibly known my true intention. My goal was simple and twofold. First and foremost, I had long felt I deserved to be accepted as a member of the art collective known as AWCY, or Are We Cool Yet? Since the 19th century, they had been championing the creation and exhibition of anomalous artwork, truly pushing the boundaries of what can be considered artistic expression despite the Foundation's attempts to censor AWCY's transcendent art. I had admired their mission statement from afar for a number of years and strived to achieve much the same in my own artwork. However, none of my previous pieces quite met the collective's anomalous pedigree. I know a way to change that, though. Blending in at Site-19 proved to be fairly simple. As long as you stride around with purpose, few will question what you're doing. With my head in a notebook or a look of conviction on my face, I could freely make my way around the facility. But why, you might wonder? What was the actual intention behind my undercover mission? Well, that answer lies in the second half of my goal, recognition. Not just notoriety and acceptance into the ranks of AWCY, but fame throughout the anomalous art world, and all the perks that could come with. Of course, the main hurdle to overcome was that I needed to create a piece of art that was anomalous in its nature. And so, rather than wait for inspiration and materials to fall into my lap, I chose to instead seek out what I needed. The anomalies on offer at Site-19 were abundant, and knowing where to start was tricky. I made the decision, while still getting accustomed to my new surroundings, that I would start wherever I felt the most drawn to. Before the end of my first week in Site-19, I felt the first pull of an anomaly, and uncovered it in the most unlikely of places. During my day, most of the SCP Foundation living quarters are empty, meaning I could sneak around there undetected. It was in the personal bathroom of one Foundation doctor that I found SCP-063. To the untrained eye, the anomaly appears to be an ordinary toothbrush, save for the wording stenciled into the pale blue plastic, the world's best toothbrush. Of course, examining it closer, I learned of its ability to cleave through inorganic matter, like a hot knife through butter. It was quite the shock, 
slicing the porcelain of the bathroom sink by accident. That would have led to my detection had I not left soon after. But I reflected on the toothbrush, or toth brush, and what it could possibly represent. Perhaps an acknowledgement of rituals and their importance to human health, yet at the same time, being sharp enough to cut anything not organic, anything not human. Maybe a CP-063 was meant to symbolize the possible dangers of habitual behaviors. The next day I was able to bear witness to an anomalous piece I had only ever heard rumors of. For a time, I thought it to have been the reason for AWCY's founding. After all, its nickname was derived from a particular traditional art form, SCP-173, the sculpture, as those at the foundation call it. I was able to insert myself into a group of two other personnel, a researcher and security officer. The former was entering the container, housing SCP-173 to run tests, the latter protecting her. Naturally, I overheard them looking for a third and offered my assistance. Even if all I had to do was watch the sculpture intently, I wasn't even allowed to blink without getting someone else to cover for me while I did. I adored it. The messy structure of concrete and rebar defied all notions of what many believed art should be. It wasn't beautiful or pristine. It dared to be ugly, and yet it demanded to be seen, to be looked at and perceived or else it would break my neck and claim my life. It was everything I'd hoped, pure art personified. It was as I neared the end of my first week in Site-19 that I discovered my next anomalous art piece hidden away in a storage locker. SCP-010, The Collars of Control. These were a collection of cast iron collars that, according to their file, could be used to control the actions and movements of a person wearing one, via a remote control. These collars fascinated me. They were, to my interpretation, tools to control, yet simultaneously a rejection of the very rules that control human beings. Someone wearing an SCP-010 collar could potentially have their entire bodily shape reconfigured by the person wielding the remote. That alone, the fact that these objects could be used to defy the physical laws that dictate the forms we exist in was a meta comment rejecting the laws of society in order for free expression. Expression only achieved by art. It all made me appreciate AWCY's dedication to anomalous artworks, yet I was still determined to be welcomed into their collective. My first week hiding within Site-19 concluded with a visit to SCP-107. Held on a pedestal in an otherwise empty room was an empty, hollowed-out turtle shell. Now I, for one, don't respect archaeologists. Art historians are another matter, however. I would rather focus on translating the human experience into my art than waste mental energy on events or objects from hundreds and thousands of years ago. But this turtle shell might be the exception. Apparently, any liquid placed within the shell will be absorbed, only to rain down from the clouds above. There's something quite honest about SCP-107. Interpreted through the mind of an artist such as myself, it appears to be a reminder of the natural world's cyclical process. The liquid within it becomes rain, which falls and feeds the plants. The plant life in turn provides food and shelter for animals, humans too, and so on. On and on the circle of life repeats, as so embodied by the hollow shell of an ancient proud turtle. I began my second week of subterfuge with a scare, a close call that I may have been discovered. One of the Foundation's doctors had complained that his sink had been sliced in two, in spite of my best efforts to cover my tracks. It seemed that using his denture glue to repair the damage SCP-063 had done didn't quite have the effect I had intended. Nevertheless, the reaction by the Foundation seemed to imply that sort of thing happened all the time. An announcement was made reminding all researchers to not toy with the world's best toothbrush, despite how fun it was to slice things up with. Although they requested the culprit come forward, I decided to divert the Foundation's suspicions away from me, hinting to a security officer I had seen Dr. Alto Clef leaving the private bathroom, where I had accidentally broken the sink. They seemed to believe he had been capable of causing the damage. Almost being discovered meant I had to reassess my objective. Over the following few days, I tried to sink into life among the Foundation's researchers, playing the role of a helpful member of personnel so as not to attract any further suspicions. And so, I was mostly concerned with the general day-to-day -day tending to anomalies. Most of them I encountered during this time were living creatures, which were of little interest to me. 
although one by the designation of SCP-049 sporting the rather aesthetically striking appearance of a plague doctor complete with dark robes and a beaked mask. At first I thought him to be a quite an amicable, intelligent fellow, that is until I had a moment alone with him, to ask his opinions on art. The plague doctor claimed it was of little importance when compared to curing the pestilence. Naturally, I took that to be a personal insult, requesting to the research head that I be transferred away from an anomaly that was obviously not as intelligent as I first thought. Two and a half weeks had passed, and I had still remained undetected by the Foundation. However, I had been forced to reassess my mission. AWCY were hardly likely to accept me into their group if I had nothing to show for my efforts. I needed either some materials I could use to create an anomalous art piece, or preferably, something I could claim as my own. It wasn't as if the upper echelons of AWCY possessed their own detailed files on every anomaly at Site-19. They would have no idea if something I plucked from containment was an existing SCP, or a Stathis Stern original piece. So I set about finding something I could be my magnum opus, my breakthrough into the anomalous art community. My key to the fame, fortune, and artistic acclaim I so obviously deserved. You may call it plagiarism, using another anomaly as my own piece, but nobody technically owns the objects and entities at Site-19. Even the Foundation themselves are more so jailers and curators than creators. I, however, am a visionary. I just needed something to prove it. My search took me far and wide, all over the width and breadth of Site-19. By the time my first whole month had passed, I had begun to walk the corridors and pass by its containment chambers just like any other researcher, although not one who I had interacted with had any clue they were in the presence of a man who would reshape the anomalous art world. There was an SCP transferred from another facility that I witnessed during that time. According to the Foundation's files, SCP-066 had previously been a ball of braided yarn and ribbon, but had since become an amorphous ball of meat with functioning eyes. What struck me most about SCP-066 was the question it asked since transforming. Are you Eric? At first I thought, I'm not Eric, but the longer I pondered it, I began to wonder, allowing my perception to be challenged. That is what art does, after all. Perhaps much like in the Marshall Mathers sense that we are all Stan, all of us may well be Eric too. I can recall another incident encountering some SCP-131s, creatures known as the iPods, which one almost tripped me up. Their brightly colored teardrop-shaped bodies were certainly striking, a rather abstract modernist biomechanical design, but it was their eyes that I found myself ruminating on. SCP-131 instances had a single, unblinking eye, giving a constant gaze without faltering. I likened it much to the uncritical, unthinking eyes of certain audiences, who in the past had stared at my artwork and had nothing interesting to say about it. In other events, my attempts to avoid detection may have proven a little detrimental. Dr. Clef cornered me, a little perturbed that I had implicated him in the sink slicing incident. He at one point seemed to imply a desire to inflict far worse damage with a ukulele of all things, although I'm sure he was just joking. At least I hope so. The whole interaction reminded me of the urgency of my mission. I still needed my anomalous masterpiece, and would need to have an escape plan in place once I found it. During my next stint of time hidden among the ranks of the Foundation, I tried to broaden my own interpretation of what AWCY would consider to be art. Nothing in their admittedly vaguely defined rules stated my anomalous art piece couldn't be created from a more modern medium. Never mind paintings that can depict a person's death or a sculpture that moves whenever unobserved. What about something like photography? I thought to myself. However, it was around this time that my hopes for such a piece were seemingly answered in the form of SCP-105, or Iris Thompson, as she introduced herself. Iris had a rather unique relationship with the art of photography. She possessed an ability to alter images taken on a specific Polaroid Express camera from 1982. In the hands of SCP-105, the photographs would come to life, like slices of real-time frozen one moment, then moving the second she held them. She could even alter these images, reaching into the Polaroid to move or retrieve objects. It instilled an idea in me. Perhaps taking a Polaroid of my chosen anomalous art would be enough 
That is, until they realized the photographs were only interactable to Iris, and breaking her out of containment was a waste of my skills as an artist. Partway into my third month hiding out in Site-19, part of me began to wonder if the Foundation's security forces were as formidable as I had been led to believe. It seemed I barely even needed to hide my mission to join AWCY, or that I had spent so much time in their facility undetected. It was on my 68th day that I decided to reflect on some of the potential anomalous pieces I had encountered so far. <laughs> Frustratingly so, I was still yet to discover any that would wipe the smug grins off of the AWCY members, only to replace them with looks of awe. Something in Site-19 would guarantee my spot among the anomalous art collective. I was certain of it. I just had to find it. A potential candidate presented itself, one that might have even allowed me to get back at AWCY for denying my entry for so long. I was shown SCP-3037, a miniature model that depicted the city of Dubrovnik in Croatia. I was watching it and pondering the meaning behind the sculpture, thinking about why it was made to specifically look like Dubrovnik of all places. Maybe, I pondered, it was meant to be a commentary or condemnation of urbanization, given the city's walls, keeping its residents contained, confined, much like how we as humans have become trapped by our urban settings, finding comfort in being confined there. However, it was while I was examining SCP-3037 that I apparently suffered something of an incident. From the moment I touched it, I spoke in only Serbo-Croatian, believing myself to actually be the city of Dubrovnik. I awoke a short while later and was informed by another researcher that I had been administered with an extremely high dose of amnestics to negate the effects of SCP-3037. Although later that night I recalled having a dream about some delicious black risotto with squid ink sauce. The research heads ordered security officers to gather everyone in the mess hall. The Foundation was seemingly aware that they had an imposter, a charlatan in their midst, pretending to be a member of personnel. I made sure my facial expression did not betray that I was the one they sought. Not one of these Philistines could appreciate my goal of infiltrating Site-19. Not one had the slightest clue how revolutionary my actions would be for the art world. However, although staying vigilant, I became increasingly aware time might not be on my side much longer. After overhearing a conversation about something known as SCP-035, I began conducting my own secretive research into what it was. I discovered information on the so-called possessive mask within the Foundation's archives. Immediately, my heart skipped a beat. The porcelain mask that shifted from an exaggerated comedic grin to a wide frown, it would have made for a perfect art piece to present to AWCY. Much to my annoyance, SCP-035 wasn't housed at Site-19, however. Over the next few days, I petitioned to have the possessive mask transferred to the facility so that I could claim it. My greatest anomalous art piece stayed out of reach, though. I was informed by senior research staff that the mask posed a potential danger. Anyone nearby was compelled to wear it and would thus be taken over by its influence. Additionally, questions started to be raised as to why I was requesting this transfer in the first place. I was starting to grow concerned that my cover had been blown. By now it very much seemed that my time was running out. And although it shames me to admit it, to say I handled that notion with grace and professionality, well, that would be a lie. Suddenly, I found it. The perfect anomalous art piece. While rummaging around the Foundation's files, I located one about something known as SCP-1379. As I read more, I realized it would secure my spot within AWCY and forever grant me the recognition I deserved. Even better, it was a painting. Such a classical art medium, they'd never be able to refuse me. As I looked at it directly for the first time, I knew I had found my masterpiece. SCP-1379 depicted a clown and two children on the canvas, but the subject of the painting would hardly matter to AWCY. They only cared that the artwork was anomalous. And SCP-1379 certainly was. This painting would allow me to exact revenge on the AWCY members who'd failed to recognize my artistic genius for so long. Anyone that made a critical remark on SCP-1379, which those AWCY snobs were bound to do when they saw it, would first experience intense pain. After 20 minutes of sharp, severe agony, the sensations would subside. 
but that would only be the start of it. Everyone at the AWC why that dared to criticize my magnum opus, my SCP-1379 would rapidly lose their ability to imagine. Any of their creativity that allowed them to laud their artistic superiority over me would cease to exist. None of them would ever make anomalous art again, and they'd surely be forced to finally accept that I am, in fact, the greatest artist of all time. From the moment I saw it, I began to plan my escape with SCP-1379 in tow. A hundred days have passed since I arrived here, and when I leave it will be with SCP-1379 and this journal. I've not only chronicled how I infiltrated the SCP Foundation, but also cataloged more about anomalous art than anyone at AWCY ever has. Once I've lifted that painting from its containment locker, my old friends at the Insurgency have arranged for me to be extracted from Site-19. With SCP-1379, finally, I'll achieve my dream of- This journal, belonging to one Stathis Stearns, has been seized by the SCP Foundation. Stearns was discovered to have infiltrated Site-19 after only a handful of days. However, given that he posed little threat and never left the facility, security officers were instructed to monitor him closely until he attempted to escape. Aware of intelligence reports regarding various SCPs noted within his journal, the Foundation deemed Stathis Stearns a security risk after 100 days. Subject was arrested attempting to escape and is to be administered amnestics. His journal will remain at Site-19 until further notice. Oh god, I'm back. I made it back and I'm still... alive. That... thing. The old man. It had been tormenting me for months, following me, trapping me god knows where. But I'm out now. And yet somehow, that's just as bad. Let me explain. It all really started about a hundred days ago. I didn't start keeping a tally of the days until a little after things started to get strange. But if I think back, the first sign happened on a completely normal day. I'd been stocking up supplies with my eldest, Jimmy. The superstore in town had a limit on how much you could spend in a single transaction, so we had to hit up a few different places for canned food to store in the bunker. When we got back, my wife Janie said she noticed a stain upstairs. Sure enough, she pointed it out to me. A slightly discolored patch on the ceiling above our bed. There wasn't much there at first. It just looked like a little area of damp, but I promised I'd have a look at it over the weekend. No point wasting money on a handyman, I didn't think much of it. I definitely didn't think of it as anything to worry about. But I was so, so wrong. The very next day, I was outside, making a full inventory of everything in the bunker. We had everything, all kinds of practical equipment for any manner of disaster. Not just food and water, but ropes and tools, tents and sleeping bags in case my family and I ever needed to abandon the bunker and sleep in the wild. You see, my whole life I'd been sure that something was coming, that out on the horizon, the end of the world was waiting. The way I saw it, if civilization was one day going to completely collapse, then I needed to prepare to make sure my family and I made it through. Maybe part of it was the fear too, but when you're scared of something, you make yourself ready for it, right? Anyway, it was while I was listing the food rations and trying to figure out just how many months we'd survive on them, when Janie came in from the house. Jake, that stain on the ceiling's getting bigger, she declared, dragging me back indoors to show me. As far as I could see, it hadn't changed much since the day before. The day after that, though, that was a different story. Janie didn't have to point it out. I could clearly tell that something wasn't right about that mark on our ceiling. It wasn't just bigger, it was leaking. But not just water. It didn't seem like it had come from a leaky pipe somewhere in the house. It was a dark, gooey substance, almost like Par that looked as if it had bled through the surface of the ceiling from the floor above. Except that was the weird thing. There was no floor above. And our bedroom was on the highest level of the house. Apart from the attic, of course. I climbed up on the bed to take a closer look at the greasy patch that was now the size of two dinner plates. Wearing a pair of thick gloves, I reached up to wipe away some of the muck. Immediately, I could smell something burning. The fingers of my glove had started to melt. I ran into the bathroom and pushed it off my hand from the wrist. By now, this black ooze had started to spread much further across the ceiling, reaching to just above our bed. Jenny told me she didn't feel comfortable sleeping under whatever that stuff was, after it had just eaten through my gloves. I told her she didn't need to worry. It was dripping from the ceiling and we'd be fine as long as we just didn't touch it. Even then, she still opted to sleep on the couch. That night, I had a really weird dream. 
I was convinced that I'd woken up in the middle of the night, restless and uneasy knowing Janie wasn't in the bed next to me. That's when I looked up at that slick patch of darkness smeared across the ceiling. But there was something else there too. A face. A grotesque face staring down at me, grinning a wide, lipless smile. I I'm sure it was a dream. It had to be. I'd been putting off doing anything about the stain. That's why I dreamt about it, right? Or maybe I was awake and it was just a trick of the light. What do you mean you won't call someone? Janie asked indignantly. I just don't see the point, I argued. We'd gotten into something of a heated debate over what to do about the goop on our ceiling. I decided not to tell her about my nightmare, but even then she was determined that I'd get a handyman or someone to come and take a look at it. It'd be a waste of money, I tried to convince her. Why should we shell out money for someone when I can just get some disinfectant and clean it up myself? Because you don't know what it is. Even if you could just wipe it off, it might come back, she yelled. You'd rather try to sort it out quickly so you can get back to working on your bunker. That's to keep us safe, I retorted. Look, Jake, I've humored it for long enough, but you spend more time out there than looking after your own house, Janie sighed. I refused. I knew it was the stubborn, petty thing to do, but I had taken Janie's comments about my bunker to heart. She'd never minded it before, always understood that I was only doing it for us. I think she saw the good place it came from first, and that meant more than the actual work I'd done stockpiling supplies and making sure we'd have working plumbing after the collapse. Later that day, I caught both Jimmy and Jake Jr. were lingering at the bedroom door, staring up at that thick, dark sludge on the ceiling. The pair of them were both keeping themselves behind the door frame or gripping the door itself like a shield. My boys were scared of it. It was clear as day. Dad, is the house sick? Jake Jr. asked. <laughs> Houses don't get sick, his older brother interjected. It's haunted. There's a monster in the attic, right, Dad? No monsters, and the house isn't sick. I replied, forcing a smile to my sons. I'll take care of it. About a week after the stain had first appeared, it was time for the monthly drill. Every four weeks, I'd gather my family and we'd do a little practice just in case the worst should happen. At the sound of an air horn, we'd all have to grab the bug out bags I'd prepared for everyone and run out to the bunker in under five minutes. The boys were always eager. It helped that they were both young enough that we could treat it like a game. Janie, though, she didn't want to get involved in this drill. She stayed indoors trying to play it off to the kids as if she was just busy, but the side glance she shot at me said different, and it was hard to avoid the guilt that came with it. That, coupled with seeing the boy's reaction to it, convinced me that it would just be easier to have someone come take a look at the slimy patch above the bed. I needed to go to town the next day, another supply run, so I picked up the number of a repair guy while I was out, even called him on the way home, thinking that would make it up to Janie. But as I pulled up to the driveway, I could hear screaming coming from the house, I raced indoors and that's when I saw my wife standing between our two boys and it. It was like a desiccated corpse, an old man with viscous black grease leaking out of his decaying body. The same substance that had pooled on their bedroom ceiling was now covering Janie. The old man had her arm gripped in his hand, the same fluid coating her skin and burning her. She was shrieking in pain, tears running down her face as the boys cowered behind her. I froze. I had no idea what to do, so I ran. I'd acted out of panic and spent the next week regretting it deeper than any mistake I'd ever made. I'd left my bug out bag in the house and just blindly sprinted straight for the bunker while the screams of my wife and kids filled the house. In the days that followed, everything fell quiet, but even then, I barely slept. Through a porthole in the heavy metal door, I watched the rear of my home. Occasionally, I'd catch sight of movement inside, some tiny bit of motion, usually at night. I kept hoping it would be Janie or one of the boys having found a place to hide and then making their way out the back door to me. But every time, it was only ever him. The old man slunk through my family's home, staring out at me with lidless eyes, his jaw locked in a twisted grin like he was enjoying tormenting me. A sharp knock on the bunker woke me up from the short, restless sleep. I sat bolt upright, immediately expecting that thing to be on the other side. It was the handyman I'd called a few days earlier. It seemed like such a trivial matter now. Ah, there was no answer at the front, he explained to me. I hope you don't mind me coming around the back, your side gate was open. Barely paying him any mind, I dashed towards the house. There was no sign of the old man, but I couldn't find Janie's body or the two boys' anywhere. I went to grab my bug out bag only to run into the handyman in the hallway. Before I could urge him to run, to leave the house, the old man's face appeared, pushing through another slick, oily black puddle in the wall grabbing the other man and dragging him in as I bolted for the door. Heading for the woods was my safest option. No, my only 
option. If I went to the police, there was no way they'd believe such an outlandish story. They'd probably suspect me of murdering my family or think I was crazy if I told them a zombie had attacked my home. That got me thinking. What the hell was that old man? He couldn't have been a zombie. For a start, there was only one, and he wasn't turning people. But there was something off about his actions. Almost like they weren't mindless shuffling attacks. There was intent behind them. He was patient. Camping out in the woods brought me no joy, even with all the supplies in my bag. Whenever I tried to sleep, I just lay awake for hours thinking of my family and the grotesque face of the old man. Every sound in the night, the wind rustling the leaves, animals cracking sticks underfoot. In my mind, everything I heard was him getting closer and closer. And pretty soon, he did. I started keeping watch during the nights and I'd catch sight of a silhouetted figure in the darkness. Every few days, he would reappear. He'd never get close enough to attack me, just enough to force me to pack up camp again and relocate. Until one night, I could hear the sound of gurgled breathing outside my tent. I reached for my flashlight, casting its light over the walking corpse that stood outside. It recoiled from the bright light, but as its decaying face illuminated, I ran, leaving my campsite and bag where they were. I didn't care. I just sprinted through the woods, branches scratching at me like the decrepit bony fingers of the old man clawing at my skin. I could hear water running, barely seeing the stream in my flashlight before my foot sank into it. Wading through, I crawled out on the opposite bank, cold, wet, and still trying to get away. The days that followed were hard. With no supplies, I had to survive on what little I had left in my pockets. My best bet, I thought, was to keep hiking, keep putting distance between myself and him. And for a while, it was working. Or, I thought it was. It wasn't until I came across tracks. Not like animal tracks, not even an ordinary human's footprints. They were thick with that black, burning tar, melting into the forest ground in the shape of the old man's foot. I'd gone around in the circle. This whole time I thought I was getting away from him, I had just been going around and around. When I stumbled upon what was still left of my campsite, I should have been overjoyed, but instead, my heart dropped through to the bottom of my stomach. I shouldn't have stopped there, that's what he wanted. But I was hungry, exhausted, and I just needed to sleep. That was when he got me. I woke up to the stench of some burning substance, only to find something locked tightly around my ankle, one of the old man's hands. Another one of his greasy gateways had opened on the nearby tree, and he was pulling me inside. The pain was what hit me first, before I could even get a good look at where I was or what was around me. Instead, all I felt was the most excruciating agony I'd ever experienced. Looking down, I saw why. The old man had two of his bony, clawed fingers hooking into my ankle, not just holding me by it. His fingers were going through, and it hurt. The black sludge was still dripping from him and onto me. The more of it passed through my clothes, touching my skin and mixing with my blood, the more I felt it burning. Digging in the fingers of his other hand, the old man pulled apart the bones in my lower leg like the wishbone of a turkey, only with a much louder and far more painful snap. The shock left me unconscious again, lost, and now with half of my leg forcibly ripped away. I had no idea where I was, and for some strange reason, the old man had left me to wander around freely, although I'd soon find out why. It hurt just to move, but I wrapped my leg up and crawled my way around the vast labyrinth. Even if I still had my bag, which had a compass in it, it still would have been impossible to navigate. I tried to take shelter under my jacket, hiding and setting up as much of a camp as I could. Every time I thought I was safe, a greasy black puddle would begin to form on the nearest wall, and that same decaying face with a lipless grin came through it. But that was why he let me wander, just so he could make sure I never slept. My suffering was a gain to him. The longer I spent there, the more tired I became. Through lack of sleep, searing pain of my forcibly amputated leg, and the fear of trying to keep away from the old man, I started to get low. I had no way of escaping. Even if I tried stepping through one of those black puddles, it would just corrode me. But I started to think, maybe that would have been better. Getting home and having to live without Janie. If she would still be gone, Jimmy and Jake Jr. weren't going to be waiting for me if I somehow managed to make it back. I had been keeping a tally of all the days since I'd left, adding on the week when the stain first appeared. It had been 90 days. I couldn't take it anymore. I just wanted it over. I didn't see the point to continue this torture. I wanted to leave and I wanted my family back. The only way to get both was to let the old man get me. But he must have known I was looking for him. Every time I yelled out into the confusing maze I was stuck in, I never got an answer. He wouldn't come and find me. 
I couldn't tell if he knew how badly I was suffering stuck here and just wanted to prolong that, or if he'd gotten bored of me. Eventually, after over another week without rest, I tried to sleep again, and that was when he came for me. Only I didn't bother to run this time, as I saw the corpse-like creature shambling towards me, black grease covering its body. I closed my eyes and waited for it to happen. When I came back to consciousness, my vision was filled with nothing but bright white light. I thought that maybe this was it, that the old man had caught me and decided to put an end to the chasing and torture. For a few brief seconds, I was certain that I was dead. What else are you supposed to think when you wake up squinting at a blinding light? But I wasn't dead and hadn't been delivered to the afterlife, and I wasn't still in that horrible labyrinth, that nightmarish place I had just been for over a month. Feeling the cold, hard ground, something in the pit of my stomach told me I was back in the real world. Still unable to see properly, I raised a hand to block out some of the glare, the sounds of heavy boots clomping towards me. Two pairs of gloved hands reached out and grabbed my arms, dragging me out of the path of the intense light. As they did, I started blinking away the spots in my vision, and that's when I saw masses of machinery and the creature, the old man, caught in the beams of three white spotlights. I looked up at the people who had saved me, a pair of figures in tactical gear, their uniforms bearing the insignia of something called the SCP Foundation. As grateful as I was to this foundation for pulling me out of that nightmare, and as glad as I was to still be alive, couldn't help but feel more and more uneasy as they debrief me. Maybe it was just how interested they seemed in my encounter with the old man, or SCP-106 as they called it, as I described what had happened in a lengthy debrief. Or it might have been how quick they were to shrug off what the old man had done to my family. Whatever it was, I, I didn't trust them even though they seemed to believe my story. Recalling it all made me think of Jamie and my two boys again. I used to be so afraid of the world ending, spent all that time and money making sure I was ready for when the end finally hit, but it had snuck up on me. It didn't matter that the earth was still turning, my world was gone, and I figured that must have been why the old man kept me alive. It could have easily killed me if it really wanted to, but it let me live on. Not just so it could torture me, but so I'd be alive to know my family was gone. It wasn't long after I realized this that the Foundation offered me something. Medicine, they said, would help me forget about it all. If I didn't take it, I'd at least get to remember what I used to have, but also live with the pain of not having it anymore. That was the old man's real torture, so I had to. As I washed down the pill with a swig of water, I thought back to Janie and my sons with tears in my eyes, wishing them goodbye before they were really gone forever. It's hard to believe it's been over three whole months since those monsters came to town. If only I had known back then what they were really doing here. Maybe I could have stopped it. I don't know, so much of this is beyond me. What could I have done? Even if I had known about it, could I have stopped what happened to all those people? Sickness, sarcasm, the SCP Foundation, it's all such a blur, but for a while, I can still remember how I spent 100 days infiltrating a circuit cult. It all began on a pretty ordinary day. I live in a small lumber town. Most of the area is cut off from major cities, connected only by miles and miles of winding road through the forest. It's a quiet rural place and a low-tech way of life. Our main business has been timber, generations of tree cutters. Even in the modern age, we keep that going. Although my home has always been off the beaten track, we often had our fair share of visitors. Hikers and wanderers who would sometimes stumble upon the town quite by accident, yet be so enthralled by all the natural beauty on offer that they just have to spend a night at the only hotel in town, the Woodsman's Lodge, run by my friend Andreas. That's what we thought they were at first, just visitors. That's why we welcomed them when they arrived, because not one of us had any idea who these people really were what they really were. We could have never known that they had chosen our town specifically. They had come here on purpose. Many of the warrior among our town thought these newcomers were strange. They were a group of five, very obviously full of cash, but less obvious was the reasons for coming here. When friendly townsfolk try to drum up conversation with any of them, they all seemed to report the same thing, that these strangers were aloof, and each one gave a dramatically different answer as to why they had come to our quiet little logging community. One said their group was just sightseeing, another said they had gotten lost. Someone else from their group told a local man that they were here on a mission from someone called Karsist Varus, 
and was rumored to have been quickly silenced by another in the visitor's party. But the one thing they all seemingly agreed on was that they wouldn't be any trouble. They insisted on that, in fact, and said that the five of them were just looking for somewhere to sleep, bed and board in exchange for cash. And so someone pointed them in the direction of Andreas's hotel. I was often there myself, not as a guest, but helping my friend maintain the place. He'd inherited the hotel from his family, but it was always in need of repair. Luckily, my background was in carpentry, and I was more than happy to help Andreas out. It wasn't one of your fancy furnished hotels, you know, the kind you'd find in a big city, all slick and sleek and owned by a big chain. It was homely, a more bed and breakfast type of place. It was, anyway. Whenever I was working over at the Woodsman's, I'd observed the strange group of visitors from a distance. They didn't seem to me like average tourists or sightseers. To me, they looked wealthy, very wealthy. It wasn't hard to picture any one of them as a politician or a businessman. The way they dressed and carried themselves made it pretty clear they were people of influence. Of course, that begged the question, what on earth were people like that doing in a town like this? I first got to speak with one of them after a few days. The five newcomers were down a man, and didn't seem at all happy about that. The remaining four were grumpy, looking angered and agitated. I wondered if maybe their fifth compatriot had left in the night, but when I asked around town, apparently nobody had seen him. Unless he's crazy and decided to hike through the woods on his own in the middle of the night. One of my friends scoffed, after telling me that no one had even heard any cars leaving the night before. I decided to ask one of the visitors when he passed me in the hallway of the woodsman's lodge, trying to broach the topic as tactfully as I could. Sorry to see you're down, a man, I told him. He stopped in his tracks, like I just caught him doing something he shouldn't be. Yes, yes, he replied, not turning around to face me. It is a terrible shame, a terrible shame indeed. But he had to leave us. It was for his own good. He knew that. We all did. Following that odd encounter, things got all the stranger the following day. I arrived at the woodsman's again, expecting to start another day of work. I'd gotten a call from Andreas earlier that morning. He was complaining about some kind of squelching noise coming from the basement under the hotel. That had only started last night. I told him I wasn't a plumber, but that I'd take a look. So imagine my surprise when I saw Andreas loading most of his worldly possessions up into a truck outside of the front of the hotel. He excitedly explained to me that he'd been bought out that the remaining four newcomers had offered to buy the woodsman's on the spot. But that's your family's hotel, Andreas, I reminded him as if it was already too late. I was never going to keep it afloat forever, he shrugged. When they told me how much they were willing to pay, I couldn't refuse. Who would have done the same, Ingvar? I've never been offered so much money. This all made it very clear. These guests were here to stay. It had taken less than a week for me to grow suspicious of these people. It wasn't in my nature to pry, but so much about them just didn't make any sense. They were clearly rich enough to buy Andreas's hotel like it was nothing. Just like an ordinary everyday purchase, like buying a loaf of bread. But they were far too insular to seemingly want to run a hotel for our friendly logging town. It left me scratching my head over the whole thing, making the question of what they were really up to stick out like an unignorable splinter. Were these just careless rich folk with more money than sense? Had they somehow grown disillusioned with their wealthy, affluent lifestyles, and were now using this hotel to learn how to connect with people on a more fulfilling personal level? Or did they have a different agenda? Something else that they were trying to hide? It turns out, they did. I decided to formally introduce myself to the new owners of the Woodsman's. After all, I knew this place well. It always needed something repaired. Plus, if I could keep my little side job of working there as a handyman going, then maybe I could find out exactly what they were doing. I was greeted by the man I'd spoken briefly to the other day, looking at me with a scowl as I stood in the doorway. Hello, sir, I greeted warmly, met with silence. Uh, we, uh, we, we met the other day? What do you want? Oh, well, um... I continued, disarmed by the bluntness. I, I understand your group just bought this place. I had a gentleman's agreement with the last owner. I'd help him out, fix things that need fixing. I, I just thought I should offer the same service to you if you'd be interested. Might help get this hotel up and running nice and quick for you, so you can start making a return on your investment. With that, the door was unceremoniously slammed in my face. At first, it certainly seemed like my options for uncovering more about this strange group were all but depleted, or at least doing so through any legitimate means. But just as I was reaching a desperate point where I was considering donning a balaclava and breaking into the hotel in the dead of night, opportunity re-emerged from behind that closed door. We were sorry to turn you away yesterday. One of the other visitors apologized somewhat insincerely, but we would be delighted to take you up on your offer, provided you accept a few conditions. Conditions? I echoed. What would those be? 
We would need you to start on repairs immediately. We want to open up the hotel's doors to guests in the next few days as a matter of urgency, he explained. But you will need to be discreet. Privacy is very important to us, so we hope to maintain that for our guests. It all seemed like a lot of hoops to jump through. Certainly more than Andreas had ever given me when he used to run the Woodsman's. But it felt like the right call, if at least it got me closer to answers. In hindsight, I should have turned them down. Over the course of the next week, things seemed to run relatively normally. I'd be given a checklist of things to fix around the hotel, and for the most part just focus purely on the tasks at hand. But whenever the strange new owners were near, I'd try to subtly listen in on their conversations. They seemed to mostly talk about running the hotel though, like they knew I was around. A few tourists started showing up, in fact. It seemed to get much busier than usual pretty quickly. I asked one of the odd owners about it, and he just brushed it off as the result of their group's marketing the Woodsman's Lodge more widely on the internet. I didn't see much of the hotel's guests staying out of their way as I'd been instructed to, but it did strike me as odd how few of them seemed to leave. Some I spotted around town, usually those traveling as a couple or in a larger group. Any that were staying alone, though, they didn't seem to venture beyond the woodsman's. None of them checked out, either. But their rooms would be empty and often needing repairs, mainly scratch marks on the wooden floorboards. Two and a half weeks after that weird group had arrived and bought up my friend's hotel, I got a call from someone I knew who lived next door to the woodsman's. The hotel! Someone was screaming! She said frantically over the line. Get her quick, they might need you! I checked the time. It was the dead of night, so late that it was almost the start of the next day. Racing quickly over to the hotel, I was greeted by one of the owners. He had rushed to the door wide awake like he hadn't even been sleeping. When I told him there were reports of blood-curdling screams, he reprimanded me. You were told our guest's privacy must be maintained, he scolded. If you must know, one of the hikers staying with us tripped over and had a nasty fall. He landed downstairs in the basement, and he's in a lot of pain not to be moved. We've already called for an ambulance. I wanted to take what he said at face value, but the fact he wouldn't let me see the injured man felt suspicious. I spent the night with the person who lived next door to the hotel, watching the woodsman's lodge for any sign of ambulance. It never arrived. That was when I remembered. He had said the guest fell into the basement, the same basement Andreas had heard a strange squelching coming from, and not once had these new owners asked me to take a look down there. Already, I was even further suspicious of the new owners now. I had no idea what they were up to. The wild theories in my head ranged from them being a group of sadistic serial killers using the hotel to lure victims, or a shadowy government black ops team up to something nefarious. Enough was enough. I needed answers. I couldn't wait for an opportunity. I had to create one. While as few people were in the hotel as possible, I snuck into the main office. Not to steal anything or even peek just yet, but break the legs off a desk. If they asked me to fix it, then I would be able to spend longer in the office with no supervision. Sure enough, they soon asked me if I'd be able to fix the desk, and that was my way in. I started rummaging through the filing cabinets, rifling through whatever I could find. Old expense reports, legal documents left behind by Andreas, but there was nothing that could give me any inkling as to what was actually going on, until there was. You see, as much as it came as a surprise to no one more than me, I wasn't the only one looking into this new, strange group. One of the guests entered the office and quickly realized what he was doing. At first, he seemed to imply that I was somehow in a league with the new owners, but I was able to talk him around, telling him I was just trying to get to the bottom of what they were up to. That was when he revealed to me who he was. Agent Clerkson, he introduced himself. I'm here on behalf of the SCP Foundation. After he brought me up to speed on what the hell all that meant, we arranged to reconvene somewhere they wouldn't overhear us. Meeting up at the lumber mill, he explained that these four strangers were a cult, a subsect of a strange religion I had never heard of called Sarcasism. But after Agent Clerickson described their practices, I wouldn't soon forget. Ritualistic sacrifices, cannibalism, and even far, far worse than that. It made me feel sick just hearing about it. Over the next few days, Clerickson agreed to let me help in his investigation, offering me the chance to help the Foundation and make it so that nobody in my remote little logging town would ever have to suffer the memory of what the Sarkic cult were up to. Little did I realize, he also meant me. I did my best to spy on the death and disease-worshipping cultists without drawing too much suspicion, and reported my findings back to the Foundation agent, but it quickly became clear that he was unimpressed with my current method of just eavesdropping, so instead he suggested a more direct approach. Clerickson gave me a book on the Sarkic religion, telling me to memorize as much as I could, and then approach the cultists as if I shared in their twisted beliefs. Even reading the techniques of Grand Carcist Ion was enough to make my stomach turn. 
All the grotesque things that the founder of this cult's beliefs preached in order to achieve something akin to godhood? It was horrific. What was much more horrific, though, was that our plan went awry. I asked to speak alone with one of the cultists, and instantly started explaining that I have observed them for a time, and I come to realize that we were one and the same. In a state of panic, I regurgitated anything I could still remember from reading about sarcasm, their goal to achieve apotheosis through will, the consumption of gods, and sacrifice. But I must have said something wrong. One of them stuck up behind me and knocked me unconscious. I woke up in a daze, a splitting headache running through my skull. I was in a cage, in a part of the hotel I hadn't seen before. It was dark, absent of natural light. There were others too. I recognized one or two of the hotel's single guests, also trapped in cages. Agent Clerkson was nowhere to be found. The Sarkic cultists spent the next day asking me how I had found them. I told them the truth, and answered their questions the only way I knew how, but I couldn't make them believe me. Liar! One spat. You did your homework, I'll admit. But the Foundation is known for working in broad strokes, missing out on the finer details. We're neo sarkites another explained. You were spouting the teachings of the proto sarkic religion. We believe the only way of becoming a god, achieving the apotheosis, is through sheer will. And in terms of sacrifice, one of the other cultists chimed in, We'll sacrifice many in service of us few, but you'll soon come to witness more of that. They kept me in the cage for days, without food and barely any water. I felt so drained of energy before long, and I soon realized why no one had heard the captive guests calling out for help. They were so weak that they could barely gather enough strength to shout, and those that did, their voices were too weak to reach anyone above the basement. The cultists came and went all throughout the day, alternating between running the woodsman's lodge and coming down into the dark, cramped, and disgusting room below. The stench was foul, yet not one of the Sarkic cultists seemed to mind. They would just talk endlessly about the new age of flesh before dragging their next victim out of their cage at night and taking them into a back room. By this point, all the remaining hotel guests that had been caged up with me were gone. I could never fully see what went on in the other room, but I certainly heard a lot. There were muffled screams followed by chanting in a language I didn't understand. Then came the noise of something slithering. All the while, the cultists who had gathered in the room with their captive victim kept reciting their incantations. I had no idea what was going on in there, but the hotel guests never re-emerged, just the Sarkites. I'd read enough about their rituals to get a pretty good idea. I'd lost track of how long I'd been prisoner when Agent Clerkson appeared in the basement. The cultist's backs have been turned just long enough for him to slip downstairs undetected. For a moment, I thought I was saved, only for my heart to sink when he told me he couldn't get me out. I pleaded with him, but he insisted that he needed to know exactly what was going on down here. As he left me on my own, I cursed him under my breath. Before much long, the cultists decided it was my turn. They dragged me out of my cage and into the back room, strapping me to a chair. I had no strength to fight back, but I had plenty of fear. There were more cages back here. It was an old storeroom that they were now keeping nightmares in. The things in the cages were disgusting abominations, masses of bloody, gooey flesh, flesh that had once been human. I realized these were the hotel guests, the ones who traveled alone, who never checked out, whose fingernails had left scratches on the floorboards as they were dragged out of the rooms by the cultists. Using a cattle prod, one of the Sarkites started directing a creature towards me. The horrible mutant was getting closer, an appendage resembling an arm reaching out at me. It was going to turn me into one of them, and I couldn't stop it. Scared for my life, I mustered the little energy I had left to try and pull away from the sickening creature. But just as it was about to make contact, someone kicked down the door. Agent Clerickson had returned with reinforcements, members of a mobile task force that promptly arrested the Sarkic cultists and sealed the room containing the monsters for the time being. He sat down next to me and explained what had gone on, but I was barely awake enough to keep up with all the details. Something about SCP-610 instances and rare to see them this far out of Siberia, but he promised that the SCP Foundation would be ordering the creatures to be incinerated soon. The Woodsman's Lodge would have to be burned down as part of the cover story. As for me, I just want to forget the whole ordeal. The Sarkic cult, all the people they turned into monsters, the horrifying things they do, the SCP-610s, all of it. I want it all gone. Luckily, Agent Clerickson has given me something he says will help with that. He called it an amnestic. Okay, this isn't good. 
I know you have no idea who I am, I have no reason to care, but my lovely wife Brenda and I got ourselves into kind of a sticky situation here. We just wanted to go shopping, gosh darn it, and now we're trapped in here. I think there are monsters. Oh god, this is horrible. I'm so scared, not just for my life, but for hers. And worst of all, why does it feel so oddly familiar? Okay, okay. Gotta keep a cool head. How did this all begin? It'd been about a year since the incident. Uh, we don't like to talk about it much. My psychiatrist tells me that after I was kidnapped by that mysterious international criminal organization and kept in their clutches for 100 days, it's likely I repressed most of the memories to avoid the trauma. He told me it's an extremely common reaction. So common, in fact, that even Brenda can't fully remember the exact circumstances of my kidnapping. Just her immense gratitude when the FBI brought me home. Eventually, we moved out of our old place, too many dark spots, and into a new apartment in a different town in a different state. You know, things were good until one day we realized we didn't have a coffee table. Oh, who can live without a coffee table these days? So we decided to make our way to the local Ikea to buy a Thorpe coffee table. Brenda wouldn't let me go alone. She never lets me out of her sight anymore since I was kidnapped. Neither of us had been to an Ikea in over a year, so naturally we found it easy to get lost in there. Those warehouses are confusing after all. But this time, it was different. We were lost for hours on end. We even started calling out for help, but we never got any reply. And after what must have been closing time, the overhead light shut off. Well, we were less than calm about it. As a day passed, the two of us stuck together. We watched enough Scooby-Doo cartoons in our youth to know that splitting up to cover more ground is the quickest way to get irreparably lost. That being said, it's not like sticking together did us any better. We kept wandering through the different departments, wondering if we passed that Lomar cabinet or that copying chest of drawers before. We walked until our legs ached, trying to stay strong for each other. It's impossible that we'd be trapped in here. Sure, I know that warehouses can be a little overcomplicated, but this is ridiculous. By the time the day ended, or at least by the time the store's lights turned off, we were able to find a Slatum queen-size bed to rest for the night. Maybe we'll be able to find our way out tomorrow. How long have we been in here? I checked the date on my phone. 72 hours. Though, of course, there's no internet or cell service in here. Naturally, Brenda and I get up when the lights turn on and start walking again. Surely anyone who walks for long enough has to find something, right? We both hold this hope in our hearts as we pass what feels like miles of cheap, flat-packed display furniture, wondering what on earth is going on. Sometimes we see figures moving in the distance. Part of me can't help but wonder if they're really there or if I'm just losing my mind in here. Difficult to say. It feels hyperbolic to even express this thought, but there's something oddly frightening about the things I see out of the corner of my eye. I start to get the sense that we're not alone in this strange place. And frighteningly, I don't know if not being alone in here is really such a good thing. At least we have each other in here. Oh god, oh god, oh god, things just got a lot worse. So, Brenda and I were walking down one of the many latticed aisles of the kitchenware department when the lights shut off. Thankfully, we'd picked up a pair of Fryel rechargeable flashlights, so moving in the dark was no longer a deal breaker for us. Goody goody. Or at least that's what I thought, until we encountered something horrific in there. Look, Brenda said, pointing into the distance. It's a member of staff. I couldn't tell you why, but the second Brenda said that, a chill went down my spine. It was like the lingering after effects of some memory I couldn't recall. There was a silhouette in the distance, and in the beam of the flashlight, I could make out the faint colors of an IKEA staff member's uniform. I knew right there and then that it was time to get the hell out of there. But before I had a chance to say anything to Brenda, the so-called staff member had already closed the distance. It ran into the beam of our flashlights, its long, drooping arms and featureless face shining in the light. Instinctively, I threw myself into its path to protect Brenda. It forced me to the ground and began beating me with its fists, kept repeating in this kind of freakish, robotic voice. The store is now closed. Please exit the building. If Brenda hadn't smashed it over the head with a vat-not stainless steel kettle and beat it to a pulp on the ground, I would have been done for. So, now we know. There are monsters in here. Great. Food and water are becoming an issue. It's not something we've needed to address until now because of the healthy supply of snacks in Brenda's purse, but there's a hard limit to things like that. We realized we really needed to find food in this place or we'd be doomed. But after the encounter with that monster, we're moving cautiously. Who knows how many of them are still out there. We can't travel at night anymore. That'll keep us safe, but it won't do anything about our hunger situation. It's only a matter of time. Brenda's a genius. 
I don't know how I'd ever survive in this terrible place without her. I'd probably die on day one of my own. She remembered that no IKEA is complete without a little mini cafeteria where they serve a variety of Swedish dishes, including their famous IKEA meatballs. All we need to do in the otherwise sterile environment of the IKEA is follow the smell until we found our way to sweet, meaty salvation. And that's exactly what we did. Eventually, this plan bore fruit, and we found our way to the cafeteria. I'd never been so happy to see crappy furniture store food. We both grabbed a bowl full of meatballs, when suddenly, just before I could take a bite, I felt an overwhelming wave of nausea. Something about it felt so incredibly, unsettlingly familiar. What the hell was going on here? Another day, another near-death experience. Our hearts leaped up into our throats when we turned a corner and saw one of those faceless monsters just standing there in the next aisle. We were ready to either square up or run for the hills, but oddly, this time, it didn't even seem to register our presence. Mm. It was almost like, during the day, they didn't have the same aggressive nature to them. Uh, curiouser and curiouser. Just like it said when it first attacked me, I think these things really only do attack when the store is closed. I guess that makes them lawful evil. God, I miss DMD. We're getting a little better at the whole freaky supernatural IKEA thing. Brenda figured if there are monsters out there, our best bet would be to arm up and protect ourselves. And hell, I'm not gonna disagree. We scavenged different parts of the store to make ourselves a mini IKEA armory, barred full meat tenderizers, Borda chef's knives with Borda meat cleavers from the same set. We also picked up some fracta rope and tarpaulin, and a pair of stylish Vardlins travel backpacks to carry all our new IKEA swag in, in addition to the food we've been keeping in the IKEA Pruda Tupperware packs. With the two of us together and all this equipment, I feel like we're ready for anything. In the following week, we discovered that we were not, in fact, ready for anything. While what we would later call the Eight Days of Hell started off rather pleasantly, the standard wandering, foraging, and sleeping, it ended in a no-holds-barred fight for our lives when the lights turned off unexpectedly while we were surrounded by maybe 20 members of demonic IKEA staff. Even with our weaponry, we couldn't fight many of them. Instead, we ran for our lives in the dark. That's when Brenda tripped over a carelessly discarded Lilalbo three-piece toy train set. I ran back to help her up, but they were already too close for us to make it out of there. Terrified, we hunkered down and waited to die in each other's arms. That's when a series of expertly placed gunshots rang out through the air, and the staff members collapsed onto the ground, each of their faceless heads perfectly perforated by a well-aimed bullet. We looked up to see the face of our savior, a strange man holding a rifle and a bulletproof vest grinning wildly. Come with me if you want to live, he said. And we did. So, we did. When we woke up the next morning after practically passing out from the stress, Brenda and I saw that we'd been shepherded into a miniature makeshift campsite by our mysterious, well-armed Good Samaritan. He told us that his name was James, and he'd been trapped in what he referred to as the infinite Ikea for weeks now. Thankfully, he had his trusty rifle with him, or he probably would have been killed by the staff long before now. We decided, out of politeness, to not ask him why he'd brought a rifle and a bulletproof vest into Ikea in the first place. We were just happy to be alive. We even gave him a few of our tubs of meatballs as thanks for the daring assist. James told us that there were others trapped in here, some of which have even made full settlements. With his weaponry and our supplies, we might even have a good chance of finding others out there, forming a group and getting out. And that sounded like a great idea to Brenda and I, so we were more than happy to tag along. Over the next 21 days, we explored more of the infinite Ikea with James. It certainly felt safer with him around, being able to take on the staff at a distance rather than risk being overpowered and killed in a more traditional struggle. James is a really nice guy, if a little strange. During our 21-day period of searching for others, James killed a few different staff members during the night. For Brenda and I, killing off attacking staff members is a profound relief. But James, he seems to take an almost perverse pleasure in killing them. But we do what we can to overlook that fact. At the end of the day, even if he is a bit of a freaky gun nut, he's a valuable asset in a world like this. However, for days on end, our search for a camp was fruitless. There were supposedly a huge number of communities inside the infinite Ikea, which often have their own unique cultures and hierarchies. It was hard to believe that all of this was actually happening. Was James just making it up and taking us for a ride? But even if he was just crazy, what other options did that leave us? We just had to keep going, but nothing would prepare us for the kind of madness we were about to face. At some point during our journey, when we were still searching for one of the supposed outposts hidden in the depths of the Ikea, 
we were ambushed, but not by the staff. No, it was a collection of human beings wielding knives and dressed in the staff's clothes, wearing their hollowed out heads like masks. There were maybe 20 of them when they got the jump on us, surrounding us and neutralizing any advantage James's gun could have given us. These masked strangers identified themselves of a nomadic gang calling themselves the Sons of Vardigan. They'd come from an outpost that had since fallen, so at least we knew that James was right when he told us about the communities out there in the Ikea. And then something even stranger happened. One of the Sons of Vardigan pointed at me and said he recognized me. I said that was impossible and that I'd never seen him before in my life. He brandished his knife and started getting in my face, claiming I was lying. That's when Brenda stepped forward to defend me, telling him to step off. As wonderful as her intention was, this just made things worse. A few other members of the Sons of Vardigan began ganging up on her, and that I simply couldn't abide. Without even thinking, I threw an impulsive punch, laying out one of the goons. That turned all heads my way and gave James an opportunity to take his chance. He turned his rifle towards some of them and opened fire, killing several of them and scattering the rest. Maybe we were better at this whole survival thing than we thought. Over the next couple of weeks, we continued our search, our confidence bolstered by our win against the Sons of Vardigan. We made occasional stops, searching out cafeterias to refuel our meatball supply. You need protein in the infinite Ikea. At some point during the journey, James asked Brenda and me a strange question. Have you ever heard of the SCP Foundation? Well, neither of us could answer that question. There was a strange, faint memory of that name. Was it some kind of charity? Maybe a government thing? I don't know. But something about it, just like so many other elements of this impossible situation, is eerily familiar to me. I just don't understand. I just don't get it. And it frightens me. 68 days into our confinement, we found something horrifying. One of the camps that James had alluded to earlier, or at least what was left of it. The walls were broken down, and the courtyard area of this makeshift community was littered with corpses. Brenda and I were horrified by the sight of what seemed like some kind of massacre. James just strode forward into the camp, observing the aftermath of some unknown carnage. Hmm. Looks like we got here too late, he said. Shame. A real shame. James advised us to collect any resources worth taking from the ransacked camp and moving on. No point crying over people we never even knew. But looking at the bodies, part of me felt as though I had known these people once. Perhaps in another life. I got closer to one of these deja vu inducing bodies and noticed something strange. The body had gunshot wounds. Over the next four days, a nightmare erupted. After discovering the massacre at the camp, I came to realize that James couldn't be trusted. He was dangerous and unstable, and I had every reason to believe he was the one behind all those killings. I relayed these facts to Brenda and told her that we needed to get away from him as quickly as possible. But when we attempted to escape, he caught us and held us at gunpoint. He seemed intent on killing both of us. He was bigger, stronger, and better armed than the two of us, so all I could do was distract him and hope for an opportunity to turn the tables. I asked him who he really was and why he was here. So, figuring he had nothing to lose, he told us. Once upon a time, he had been a mobile task force operator, kind of a special ops guy for that SCP Foundation group. He'd been one of the best, but after he horrendously botched a mission, including intentionally murdering many civilians over the course of his career, you know, just for fun, he'd been demoted to D-Class, which, to the best of my knowledge, seems to be a human guinea pigs this SCP Foundation used for cruel experimentation. One of the experiments they used him for was apparently this very location, the Infinite Ikea. He'd been in here for a long time now, with guns and ammo he'd stolen from other Foundation operatives that had been trapped in here. In a sense, he loved it in here. He got to do his favorite thing of all, killing people with nothing to stop him. And now he was going to do it to us. I hugged Brenda tight. I was sure this would be our last moments. James leveled the barrel of his rifle at us and prepared to fire, when two figures emerged from the darkness behind him, wielding knives and hammers. It was a woman and a large man. They lunged at James and struck him again and again and again, until he collapsed to the ground, bleeding, dying, gone. These two people then looked up at me with a sense of recognition and amazement. And at that moment, I realized that I recognized them too. They were Vicky and Barry. I knew them. I I'd been here before. Over the next several days, it all came back to me. The hundred days I'd spent in the infinite Ikea before. Well, going on 200 days now. 
The friends I'd made and lost, the strength I'd gained, I'd never been kidnapped. That had just been a cover story formulated by the same SCP Foundation that produced that gun-toting maniac James. Brenda was amazed to hear all this, and I was both amazed and delighted to see that Vicky and Barry had survived. We believed that Barry had died after leading the staff away from the encampment, but as it turns out, some people are just too badass to kill. My memories were hitting me like a high-pressure fire hose now, washing away the cobwebs and giving me a kind of clarity that I hadn't known in an entire year. And in that glorious moment, I remembered I'd gotten out of here before. I could get us all out of here again. The route was somewhere inside me. I just needed to follow it. Day 200. I remembered somewhere deep down that I needed to keep moving. I led Brenda, Vicky, and Barry behind me. They trusted me, and their trust would be rewarded. Step after step, hour after hour, until eventually, we arrived. Light filtered through the glass double doors. A smile spread across my face. Our breath quickened. Barry began to tear up. After all this time, we'd finally found our way out. We officially survived 200 days in Ikea. As we stepped closer, the automatic doors opened, as though it was congratulating us. We held hands and stepped out into the light together. What on earth is going on? One minute I was just doing my job protecting the President of the United States from any potential attacks. Next thing I knew, thousands of people were dead, the world was thrown into chaos, and the so-called SCP Foundation had declared war on the human race? Okay, okay. Let's get back to day one before things get too confusing. Day one. I'm a member of the President's Secret Service, so it's my job to keep POTUS safe from all manners of potential dangers. My son, Thomas, was in the care of my ex-wife across the state when everything went south. It started on the White House lawn where the president was giving a speech about his plans to shrink the deficit. That's when he appeared. A stranger slipped into the press junket. He was dressed like a British butler. It was almost comical. Myself and the other agents immediately flagged him as a potential threat and moved in to intercept him. That's when things went nuts. This butler was one of the greatest fighters I've ever seen. He effortlessly disarmed the intercepting agents, and while we desperately tried to wrestle the president off the stage, the butler stole one of my fellow agent's pistols and blew off the president's head with one perfectly aimed shot. Of course, we returned fire, mowing the butler down in a hail of bullets, but it was already too late. People were screaming and running. I could see out in the city beyond there were explosions, smoke rising, a cacophony of screams. In an instant, everything had changed. We hunkered down in the White House to protect the Vice President. That's when, upon turning on the news, we saw the message. It had been sent to every company, every station, and it read, The following is a message composed via consensus of the O5 Council. For those who are not currently aware of our existence, we represent the organization known as the SCP Foundation. Our previous mission centered around the containment and study of anomalous objects, entities, and other assorted phenomena. This mission was the focus of our organization for more than 100 years. Due to circumstances outside of our control, this directive has now changed. Our new mission will be the extermination of the human race. There will be no further communication. Day 2. Of course, I try to get through to my ex-wife and check that she and Thomas were okay, but by that time, communication had already broken down. Strangely, the internet and major TV news channels remained in operation, allowing them to spew a constant barrage of the horrors going on outside. All over the world, hideous monsters and malicious creatures had flooded the streets, killing human beings en masse. I don't understand. Is the SCP Foundation behind all of this? I hadn't even heard of them until yesterday, and now they were apparently releasing living nightmares everywhere. Apparently with the intent of wiping out the human race. All I could do was stay in place, hope my family was staying safe, and do what I can to protect the Vice President. Day 3. The Vice President is dead. The same could be said for the rest of my team. Some terrifying zombie-like man somehow breached our security perimeter and melted down the President and six Secret Service agents into this thick black sludge. Obviously not an ideal situation. At that point, the chain of command collapsed entirely, and we decided to make a run for it. Bullets didn't seem to work on that rotting old freak, and I'm not the kind of idiot who sees the point in expending a few extra magazines on a lost cause. But by the time I was outside, it was already nightfall, and the horrors were just beginning. Day 4. It's hell on earth out here. I was wandering the streets of DC, trying my best to remain scarce despite the chaos unfolding all around me. There were these... creatures. Abominations of human flesh twisted into unimaginably unnatural configurations roaming around, attacking any humans they saw. 
and anyone they touched started to transform into more of them. I decided to sleep in the back room of a ransacked post office that night. I didn't want to move in the dark with these things around. One touch, and I'd be dead. No thank you. Day 5. Why the hell did they do this to us? These monsters at the SCP Foundation flooding the world with abominations intent on ending human life! One of those monsters almost killed me today. I was trying to sneak down a back alley when I heard the chittering of bony legs following me. I turned and saw it reaching out towards me with fleshy tendrils. I raised my handgun and fired several times to no effect. I was preparing for death or worse when some huge metal vehicle I couldn't recognize pulled into the alley. Men spilled out of it. Well, they weren't just men, they were cyborgs in heavy, technologically advanced armor and weapons straight out of Star Wars. They burned the creature to death with a volley of concentrated heat beams. I thanked my rescuers profusely and asked them their names. They simply told me, We are devotees of the Broken God. Stay safe out there, fellow traveler. McCain, be with you. Day 6. I wasn't just surviving for my own sake, you need to understand that. I wanted to get back to my ex-wife and son as quickly as possible, knowing all the horrors that the SCP Foundation had unleashed onto the world for no logical reason. As morbid as it sounds, even if we all died, I'd rather we die together than apart. But every day, I developed a new reason to know this journey wouldn't be easy. While trying to escape from one of DC's more densely packed urban areas, I encountered a horrific monster. It looked like a giant mutant crocodile the size of a bus, vicious as hell, and it could talk. When it clasped its eyes on me, it growled, Disgusting. It started running towards me. But the actual physical structure of DC saved my ass this time. You see, the streets of DC are designed to give in and collapse if ever huge military vehicles roll over them, in order to prevent the capital from being invaded by a military force. The reptile clearly didn't know this, because it seemed awful confused when the ground gave out underneath it, and I was able to run to safety while it tried to scramble up the walls. Day 7. A week into this hellish new world, and against all odds, I'm still alive. Though it's not for lack of trying from the gaggle of killer freaks the monsters at the SCP Foundation have unleashed to terrorize the streets. Today, I saw something terrifying. A man was lured into a dark corner by the voice of a young child claiming to be his daughter. He approached the dark with tears in his eyes when a pack of monsters jumped out and began devouring him alive. Their long, sharp fangs and raw red hides are going to linger in my dreams forever. You can't trust voices anymore, you just can't trust them. Day 8. I'm almost at the edge of the city, but the nightmares continue. I was able to narrowly dodge a group of men walking in perfect step, like one of those flash mobs that used to always pop up. In the middle of them, there was a woman with what looked like some kind of strange skin condition. They didn't seem all that aggressive until they came upon a pair of women also trying to make their way out of the city. The men in the trance-like state charged at them, holding the woman in place and seeming to strangle them, while the woman with the skin condition just laughed. I would have charged in there to help, but there were maybe 20 of the hypnotized men in the group, and with one magazine of handgun ammo left, even with perfect aim, I couldn't drop them all. But the guilt of leaving those women to die will stay with me forever. Over the next nine days, I encountered zombies. I kid you not, genuine, honest to God, zombies, the walking goddamn dead, infesting a road on the edge of town. There was a huge crowd of them, gurgling and growling skin looking green and rotten. I've seen so many zombie movies, but seeing the genuine article in person was still utterly revolting. When they spotted me and started running towards me, I instinctively pulled out my weapon and fired several times. I scored a couple of respectable headshots, but they just kept coming. The only thing I could do was run into a nearby gas station and lock the door behind me. For a second there, I thought I was doomed, until I suddenly developed the wherewithal to check behind the cash register, where, to my immense luck, the clerk had apparently left a pump-action shotgun with several shells. With the extra firepower, I snuck out of the back of the gas station, approached the zombie horde from behind, and executed them with a series of well-chosen shots. I managed to steal and refuel a car to get out of town. On the way out, just to add to the surreality of the whole situation, I saw a witch in a ditch. Sounds like I just made it up for the rhyme, but no. There was a genuine witch hiding in the grass, chewing on a dead body. That was the moment that I knew, on some level, that things would never be normal again. The best I could hope for was survival. The 21 days after that were incredibly eventful, to say the least. Thank God I had forged a shotgun with me, or I would have been a goner. Because almost as soon as I left town, that huge monstrous lizard appeared again, carrying a dead deer in its mouth. Had it followed me, or was it just a coincidence that I ran into it again? 
Hell, maybe there was more than one of those horrible dinosaurs out there. But the second it noticed me driving by, it immediately began to chase me. I put the pedal to the metal and hoped beyond hope that this monster wouldn't catch up to me. But I kept seeing it get bigger and bigger in my rearview mirror. That creature was impossibly fast for its size. And believe me, when I saw it was getting close, I started sweating. With a sharp turn at a crucial moment, I was able to gain a vital lead and lose the beast. Soon enough, it was no longer in my peripherals, which was exactly how I liked it. Then I ran into a gaggle of horrific creatures that I can, well, hardly even explain. I was getting out of my stolen car to forge for food in a nearby supermarket, when suddenly I was swarmed by what I can only describe as a group of human chicken monsters. As stupid as they sound compared to the other things I've faced, they were fast and incredibly aggressive. I was lucky to dodge a few of their brutal charges and retaliate with a few blasts from the shotgun, which at least bought me time to escape. Even though I had to abandon my car, easy come, easy go seemed to be the rules of this terrible new world. Are they ever going to run out of horrible beasts to throw at me? Well, let's see. Over the 11 days that followed between periods of pure hiding, I actually had a first-hand confrontation with agents of the SCP Foundation. After all the things I've seen, if I could punch every single one of them so hard that they'd never wake up, I'd do it. In a heartbeat. It was their fault that all this was happening, and we'd never even get to know why. Well, that's not entirely true. I was able to get myself some answers the hard way. I saw a helicopter circling above while I was hiding behind a small collection of buildings. They were shining a spotlight around. And any time they saw a person walking out into the open, they ruthlessly gunned them down. When one person managed to duck away and run through a narrow alley, the helicopter landed and several men in tactical gear with assault rifles stepped out. When I recognized the SCP Foundation logo on the side of the chopper, I felt my blood rising to boil. These were the ones who killed all these people. As they began to disperse, I approached them from behind with murder in my eyes and used the shotgun to kill several of them. Before any of them had a chance to retaliate, I grabbed one of their fallen assault rifles and fired back, killing or injuring them all. The ones that were heavily injured were incapacitated, but oddly, they didn't seem to be in pain. I aimed the gun at one of their heads and told them to tell me why they were doing this. That SCP Foundation foot soldier just smiled and said, <laughs> You're never gonna know how much we've helped you. But that's okay. We're used to dying in the dark. You'll have to learn. So of course I shot him in the head. Hey, wouldn't you? I was better armed than ever. Soon enough, I had a new sidearm and an assault rifle, along with a hell of a lot of ammo from the fallen SCP Foundation agents. I took a little joy in the irony that the SCP Foundation, the ones behind all of this, had provided me with the tools to defy their reign of terror. But none of that prepared me for that maniac to attack. After getting a few days rest in a basement apartment I broke into, I emerged to continue the journey. I was maybe about 50 miles away from where my ex and son were living if they managed to somehow stay put and survive all this time. But when I left the basement apartment, something was waiting for me. It was a man wearing a white comedy mask, dripping with this strange black gunk and carrying a fire axe. Well, hello there, good sir, he said with a laugh. How lovely to meet you. It's been a while since I've seen another one like you. You look like you're carrying a lot of weight on your shoulders, but don't worry, I can help with that. <laughs> He gave a diabolical laugh and swung the axe at my head. I was able to narrowly dodge the blow and return fire into center mass with my rifle. He seemed unfazed. He just laughed and started charging forwards with another swing from the axe. Rather than shooting him again, potentially attracting some unwanted attention, I decided to just run for it. Every day, there are new surprises out here. I made my way through a small town that had been utterly decimated. Homes and buildings were empty. A huge stack of human corpses sat in the center of town. On top of the pile, there stood a heavily tattooed man, carrying a huge black blade in each hand. He was clashing the blades together and calling out, This world has no worthy opponents for the mighty Abel. Step forward and meet my blade, so at least you can die with honor, you sad, timid little sheep. I didn't feel like dying with honor that day. So I instead chose to discreetly make my way across the town, hoping that the mighty Abel wouldn't notice me. And this paid off in the end, as I was able to find an abandoned motorcycle and hightail it out of there with all my scavenged weaponry. At long last, I was so damn close. Just before day 90, that monstrous reptile came back. I swear to God that monster is following me. It's more than just a coincidence now. I was no more than 20 miles from my ex's place, driving at great speeds on my new purloined motorcycle when that giant scaly monster emerged from the side of the road and knocked me off my bike. 
If I didn't think quickly and rely on my training, I would have been killed. I'd done two tours with the Marine Corps in Afghanistan before being selected to defend the president, a job that, technically, I had failed miserably at. But those skills might be the only thing that could let me stand a chance against this monster. It reared up and tried to attack me again. I used my stolen assault rifle to concentrate fire on its eyes, trying to at least distract it. Its wounds healed quickly, and the pain of the blasts doesn't seem to have affected it in the slightest. But every time it lunges for me, I'm lucky enough to have the room to dodge it. <sighs> this isn't sustainable. I know that it will have energy long after I tire. What I need is a distraction so I can get the hell out of there. Then, an idea hits me. I turn the gun on the motorcycle's fuel tank and fire off a few rounds. Boom! A nice, big, distracting fireball. It buys me a few seconds, but that's enough to let me get away down a narrow alley and make myself disappear. All I can say is, I really hope I don't see that monster again. Isn't three times enough for one life? But just when you think things can't get any stranger, you see something that almost breaks your brain with its sheer surrealness. While traveling through the town next to the one where my ex and son live, I saw a heart. Like a giant, beating heart on spider legs with a scorpion tail destroying everything. It was tearing buildings apart and somehow setting people on fire with its caustic venom. What on earth was the SCP Foundation that it even knew about all these things? I just kept walking, avoiding attention. It's all I could do. It's all anyone can do. No one is saving a world like this. They're just avoiding getting killed in it. Or helping someone they love to avoid getting killed. Speaking of, only one day off now. Only one day off. Day 100. I arrived. After all this hell, after seeing all this nightmarish carnage that I'll never be able to unsee, I've reached the home of the ones I love. The ones I've been surviving for. I walk up to the front door, step inside, and find that the house is empty. Not a soul in sight. For a moment, I'm terrified. Had they been killed? There was no blood. No bodies. No sign of anything out of the ordinary. It means that, like myself, maybe they were on the move. Maybe they were fleeing to find safety of their own. And if that was the case, I had a pretty good feeling that I'd know exactly where they are. But my thoughts were interrupted by a loud rumbling noise coming from the house's basement. Now go and check out SCP-5000-Y, the full story compilation, and how SCP-682 tried to stop SCP-5000 for more from this horrifyingly apocalyptic scenario.